Okay, so uh, welcome to the Amherst Historical Commission public hearing and public meeting on Wednesday, February 10th, 2021, based on Governor Baker's executive order spending, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law signed Thursday, March 12th, 2020. This meeting is being held virtually using the Zoom platform. The best way to find instructions about joining the meeting by Zoom or by phone is to visit the town website at amherstma.gov, navigate to the town calendar for this day, locate the Historical Commission entry and click on the link or access the telephone number. My name is Jane Wald and as chair of the, His of the Amherst Historical Commission, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.33 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and minutes are being taken as normal. We'll begin with a roll call of commissioners in, a, in attendance. And as you hear your name called, please answer affirmatively and then place yourselves back on mute. Pat Off. Present. Robin Fordham. Present. Janet Marquardt. Present. Jane Scheffler. Present. Eddie Startup. Present. And Jane Wald, I'm present too. Uh, commission members, please indicate when you'd like to speak by using the raise hand function or whatever seems to be working. Uh, and if the chair doesn't recognize you, just jump in. Um, after speaking, please remember to mute yourself. Opportunity for public comment will be provided during the general comment, the general public comment period uh, later in the agenda. Please be aware that uh, commissioners need not respond to comments during the general public comment period. If guests wish to make a comment during that time, when called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes and at the discretion of the chair. The Amherst... The Historical Commission is holding this public hearing to provide an opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding a demolition application for 99 Dana Street, parcel 14A 134, Catherine Trost and Michael Rossen property owners, a request to demolish an outbuilding at the rear of the property. Uh, the procedure for this hearing is that I'll invite the owners or their representative to present any information if they're in attendance uh, that they would like to share about their request in addition to the application information uh, we, we've all, already received. I'll ask uh, town planning department staff to add, to add additional information as well. Then members of the historical commission may ask questions to better understand the request. I'll then close the public hearing at which point members of the Historical Commission will deliberate on the criteria set out in Article 13 of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw. At that point, the Commission will take a vote on the disposition of the demolition application. Great, so, thanks, Jane. Uh, thank you. So with that, are the Applicants or a representative? Yeah, Kate just joined the meeting, so I'm going to add her in as a panelist here. Promote a panelist. And I'm happy to share the screen. Um, welcome, Kate. Uh, you are currently on mute. Um, on mute. There you go. Start video. Hi. Hi, thanks for joining us. Well, I was watching the news. Okay. <laughs> it's a little hard to pull away, you know? <laughs> yeah, sometimes it is. <laughs> I'm going to turn the light off. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, well, I can pull up the start with the demolition application itself. Thank you. And um, you all should have received a, you know, an email with some of the information, but the, um, the application concerns a single car garage um, at 99 Dana Street. Um, and Kay, do you want to share anything about kind of the condition of the garage, the purpose for the demolition and kind of just an overview of what you're proposing? 
it's very in very poor condition if do you have any of the photographs of the back of it where you can like the wind goes in yeah yeah it's it's a it's in a bad very bad shape it's not in an historical structure it's built in the 50s i mean is it okay I'm a historical st structure. I was from the 50s too. But um, you see the back part there? That's all open. Mm -hmm. And it's just a crummy single car garage. Um, and I'd like to rebuild it so that it's um, in better condition because, you know, I, I use it for storage and I'd like to continue to be able to use it, but it's in bad, such bad condition. Here's the, you can pull up the front of the garage here. Kind of, this is what you would see from the back of the house. Um, and then lastly, I have one more. Oh, this is a similar and I, picture. And I want to be, and I'll be perfectly honest with you all. Okay, you can see the back of my house. So I have this big backyard and I have this, oh, and I, I'm a landscape architect and planner originally and right now I'm helping with my husband's business but um the way the driveway comes around behind my house it's really cuts off the backyard and I um the backyard had a bunch of it has a nice beautiful Japanese maple in it but it has uh, it had a lot of depressions so I just recently started to fill in those depressions because um, I had a little extra money to do that. And now I want to fix up this structure and I have no intention of it being a, a, a building that anyone would live in, to be real honest about that. But I do see it as a, a destination, as a place to go to and have access to my backyard. Because do you see how the driveway goes around here and it cuts off this whole backyard? And the whole time I've lived in my house, I've thought, I felt like, ah, so frustrating. Like the way that, ha the way that the previous owner did this. So anyway, I'd like to fix the building, to make it more useful. And I actually can see actually having like a little, not change the size, nothing about the size, but make it so that it's attractive and, and have a door from it to my backyard and make it kind of like a place, oh, it's a nice place to go. I'll do some, you know, I'll use it still for storage like I do now and maybe pot some plants in there mm -hmm. and go out into my yard. You know, because I don't have a terrace, I use my front yard extensively. I've planted a, a lot of trees there and it's become a real place. I feel really good about it. You know, it's, uh, and I'm excited about doing plantings in my backyard and I don't expect to make it ornate at all, just to do some really nice flowering tree plantings in my backyard. So that it's, uh, it, cause it's pretty large. Yep. And I, and, and just to note, I wanna point something else out to you. Look at this, look at the, look what the neighbor did. <laughs> This property line. <laughs> the neighbor from the previous, and then I'm oh, I'm getting over it. But right before we purchased this, when we moved here, right before we purchased it, I found out that this previous owner had done this quick claim, and they cut out a piece of our yard, and gave us a piece in their yard, which they have a fence, so we can't go in, so that they could build a very large building. <laughs> So they have the right setbacks. And I'm not talking about doing anything like that. I'm just talking about improving my simple structure so it's attractive. Mm -hmm. And so, and, uh, and making it, keeping the functionality and keeping it simple. Mm -hmm. That's all. Great, thanks Kate. And um, I will say in terms of the what my research dug up was not much in terms of the historical significance of the property or the um, structure itself. Um, the, the property card says that the garage is from 1966. Um, I did find a 1950, 56 aerial uh -huh. of the house and it, you know, there's like a shadow of a 
structure there. So, you know, yeah, whether it's the same, whether it's the same one or not, it's hard to say, but, um, you know, there, do, there does seem to be that there is a structure there, at least in 1956. That's, that's pretty much as far back as the town's aerial photography goes. Uh-huh. Um, are those, do you think those are planted fields in the back? It, it looks almost agricultural, yeah. Um, I'm not quite sure, but. I think it was, I believe that this, was, there are, on, on Dana Street, there are some really um, architecturally significant structures. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that there were some larger properties with, um, with you know, architecturally significant structures, and then um, you know a few smaller, a few you know maybe initially just those, and then these. I think this was a kit house, yeah, so four square, and they came later. But there was you know this is a farming area. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, and thanks, Ben, for sharing um, the information that you've pull, pulled up together for yep. this. Um, do commissioners have questions? I have a question. It's, it's a very superficial question, but that distinctive paint job that it has as a shed the white, is it green trim? Um, I wonder if you're keeping that or, or whether you change it or whether, and I, I, I'm not sure that we have any say in the matter, but it's just, a, it's curious to me because it, it sort of defines an era for me somehow that well, the house, white clapboard and green yeah, trim. The, the house has vinyl siding, white vinyl siding with green vinyl trim. And this you'll get a real kick out of. So I bought the house and I, it's not a, an aesthetic that I share. And if I had a lot of money, I would take it off and I'd reside the house with the, uh, and look and restore some details, honestly, on the, uh, on the house, on the original house. And I already have in the front a little bit, but, um, I think the green uh, and the white on the little shed on the single driveway, single garage were to match that. But the funny story is that the neighbor to below me, I saw people's painting that house like eight years ago. And I go, oh, what colors are they going to paint it? And they said, they're going to paint it just like your house because they liked your house so much. And I, <laughs> and I have to laugh because it's like, I would never have chosen these colors. I mean, I would <laughs> love to be able to paint my house, but it's just funny. It's just funny it's the way things go. So there's two white houses with green detail and mine is the vinyl siding and theirs is, my, <laughs> theirs is painted to match mine. <laughs> the vinyl siding issue is really interesting. I, when I first moved to this country, um, my husband and I bought a house that had vinyl siding on it. And like you, I was terribly shocked and didn't like it. And people said to me in the preservation field at the time, well, don't worry too much because it's actually protecting the wood underneath. Exactly. So eventually when you get to that point, you can know that there's a good chance that the vinyl siding, dubious as it might be <laughs> long-term, is actually quite a good protective and also it's, it's in, it's uh, minimized our uh, maintenance costs in that regard. We have put a new roof on the house. We've lived there 16 years. And um, when we're doing, we're doing things slowly because that's what we can afford, you know, in terms of improvements. We're not really planning to move. We're just, and I, you know, and honestly, the backyard is the biggest issue for me, my whole, property be, in terms of liking the property because in my best of all possible worlds I could just walk out my door in the back to the backyard but I can't because of the way the driveway goes around but um I've kind of thought through this and I think that this little building um and making it more attractive in the footprint that it is is going to be kind of a a, a move towards making an and filling those depressions in the backyard, I'm really looking forward to it because I do really like to plant trees. 
I want you to know. I planted all the trees in my front yard and I know a lot about uh, plants. And it just, took, it just took a while to get our kids through college and have the time to be able to even think about this. Yeah. I'd like to make a motion. Shall we move on with a motion? We, uh, we need to close the public hearing. Oh, if right. there are no more questions, are there any other questions? No, then we will close the public hearing and then move to the commission deliberation and that can indeed start with a motion. Um, okay, well, I move that we grant a demolition permit for the single, garage, single car garage at 99 Dana Street. And I second. Okay, thank you. Is there any uh, discussion from other commission members? I just have a general question, um, not in relationship to this particular property, but um, at what point might a detached garage become something historically significant? Just curious. Well, if it fits all the criteria for our historically significant buildings, if it's yeah. a, a particular style, architectural style, a, a famous architect, if it matches a house that is the is, yeah. is the era of detached garages does that fit into you know in, in a particular style that's i'm just curious about whether you know we could ever decide to um put a demo delay on the basis of the garage being part of a an era where you know houses didn't come with garages so they were added victorian carriage houses that have been turned into garages yeah, yeah. Right. There was a, done that a few times, actually. There's a, there was an infamous there's a, case about uh, a, a garage on, I think it was on Lincoln, that had a, a presumed yet unproven and false association <laughs> with Robert Frost. And um, so there was a, a, there was a kind of a controversy about whether to and there was one on Saki that was a former carriage house that we also deliberated a long time on. So I think it does come up. Okay. There's one by Amherst College um, going down, um, you know, through Amherst College. You can see one of the structures. And also on by Boltwood, down that little street past the inn, and you go turn. Down there, there's a couple of structures that are pretty attractive that were mm -hmm. secondary structures. And then there are a couple, there are, well, on my street, uh, there are a couple, people have turned them into things. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. I, in a gender, just, a, just a kind of vague response, I think Jen's right, that yes, there are circumstances under which I think we could. Uh, okay, done with, can I go now? Like, are you done with me? We, uh, <laughs> we, we can vote first, but oh, okay. <laughs> we're, we're almost there. Uh, okay. Is there any other discussion? All right, all in favor of uh, the motion to uh, grant the uh, demolition application. You have to do a Please. roll call. <clears throat> I'm doing a roll call. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All in favor of um, supporting the motion to grant a demolition, uh, approving the demolition application, please signify when I call your name. We're doing a roll call vote. So, um, uh, Patricia Ah. Uh, I'm I'm in favor. Robin Fordham. In favor. Janet Marquardt. Yes. Uh, Jane Scheffler. Sorry, I lost the mute button. Uh, I'm in favor. Teddy Startup? Yes. Okay, and Jane Wald, yes. So I'm in favor. So that's a unanimous um, vote to um, uh, approve the demolition application. So thank you for bringing your Wonderful. application. <clears throat> And, uh, and Kate, I'll be in touch with you about um, next steps for processing the demolition application. That. Yeah, good. Thank you very much. It's nice to meet you all. It's actually kind of fun. Yeah. <laughs> nice to meet you. Let's have some interesting things to consider. It's nice. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Bye.
Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. See you in town. <laughs> okay, um, so public hearing is uh, taken care of. Uh, so we can move on into the public meeting, um, beginning with announcements, if there are any. Okay, and I think, does, Hedy, do you have to head out shortly? Yeah, I do. I'll hopefully join you at about quarter of eight, eight o'clock. Thanks. Okay. okay. Thank you. Am I still sharing my screen? I can't. No, I'm not. Uh, I can put up the agenda here. Great. So yeah, we got the public hearing over with. Now we're on to public meeting um, with any announcements. Um, Do you have anything? Um, nothing that I guess isn't already planned to be talk talked about here. Oh, I guess the. Uh, for for the writers walk, um, we they've begun fabricating the posts themselves. Uh, they they pointed out a few missed periods on the um, on the signs themselves. So I just sent it back to Seth quickly, and he's going to make those changes. But it hasn't really delayed the process too much because they were always going to do the posts first and then the uh, sign panels themselves. But um, good to know that that's moving along and thankful that they did a final, final, final review of the signs themselves. Thank you. Um, Civil War tablets update. Yeah, so I'm happy to provide an update about that project. Um, it's been it's been definitely a little bit difficult moving the process along. The goal again is to move the tablets out of the Ruxton DPW garage in North Amherst and into the bank center where they can be, you know, more one, one they can be inspected and, you know, open to members of some members of the public, but also just uh, in better store storage conditions. Um, the, we were originally, as you guys know, we were, planning to contract with uh, DAX transportation. And that's been difficult. There's um, some lack of communication, not, not always responding to our emails about getting contracts underway. It was hard to gauge whether, I think because of COVID, their office isn't fully staffed right now. Um, it, it was hard to know, but eventually we kind of decided to go in a different direction um, and but that did waste, not waste, it, it used up a lot of time trying to um, go with that company. And so um, what we're working on now is kind of piecing together a few different companies to carry out the move. So we have um, Amherst Welding fabricated A-frame structures for us because the uh, when the tablets are moved and they need to be taken out of their crates, they're gonna be placed in these A-frame easel-like structures essentially, so they can have a really solid foundation to, to rest upon. Um, and then we're working on finding a company who can carry out the move. We're looking at um, a, a moving, an actual like, you know, moving company, and then a company that works on doing uh, granite countertops because they moving granite countertops because they have the necessary lifts and um, even like a crane like structure that can bring the tablets safely and kept, keep kept vertical onto a moving truck. And so our goal now is to kind of this project has become a priority um, hit, hit uh, moved into overdrive. We're gonna try to move them by early March. Um, the A-frames are completed and they've been moved into banks, the bank center. We have to actually reinforce the floor a little bit because these things are so heavy and we're worried about buckling on the floor. Um, but the goal is to have them moved by early to mid-March, um, have uh, members of the uh, it's hard to know exactly because of COVID who who can who can come through, but certainly a lot of documentation of the tablets just for um, because this is the first time they've been opened up and visible for a very long time, um, and then probably working with uh, 
monument conservation collaborative to inspect and, and do any restoration work that's necessary. Um, so that, yeah, that's, that's the update on the Civil War tablets. Um, you know, we're still thinking long about long-term options for display. Um, the more I've done research and continued to verify, confirm that um, an outdoor display is going to be a very difficult um, proposal because of the cost involved um, for actually de building a, a, a structure that can keep them climate controlled, keep them safe from vandalism, and is going to look really nice. So we're looking into, again, working with the Jones Library to have them displayed as part of that renovation project. And then one thing I'm looking into, and this is maybe where the Historical Commission could be involved, is looking into actually uh, making replicas of the tablets themselves, like out of a, out of a stone or um, even artificial material, I forget, Corian comes to mind, something that can replicate the marble tablets, but have them be displayed outdoors and sa safely while the um, tablets themselves are in an indoor location. So that's that that idea floated around like in early, early 2000s, because this project has had so many starts and stops. Um, so we're kind of picking up that idea again and seeing what options there are. So yeah, that's, <laughs> that's uh, what's new in the Civil War tablets world. And I'm happy to answer any questions or, you know, discuss anything further if you guys would like. And the replicas could even be reduced in scale if it made it easier right. to happen somewhere. It would right, exactly. You still read the names. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, they don't necessarily need to be the full size. I mean, the tablets are like six or seven feet by five feet tall, so they're very large. Okay, thank you. All right, yeah, of course. That's really nice to hear that's moving, moving smartly. Mm -hmm. um, next on the agenda is uh, Massachusetts Historical Commission Preservation Projects Grant. Yeah, so um, I've looked into this a little bit. The uh, grant is again, yeah, from MHC. It uh, covers, you know, rehabilitation, historic preservation costs for um buildings i think list yeah listed on the national register or maybe contributing to national register districts um and i'm happy to you know discuss further any projects um i i was contacted by the um kendrick property management and who uh maintains and um the salem place and the conkey house which is a listed on the National Register, they they are interested in finally addressing some of the, the um, issues with the Conkey House as some, some of us, many of us saw, uh, geez, when was that? In the spring, maybe. Um, there's a lot of deferred maintenance and rehabilitation work to be done there. Um, so uh, S Scott is in his name. Yeah, Scott recently got in touch with me asking well, first, he was just wondering in general, what is the process for him to do this work in as, as far as the historical commission is concerned? He was talking about, you know, roofing, siding, windows, trim, like the whole gamut, really. Um, and so I told him, you know, as soon as you finalize your scope of work, um, you know, that it would need to be reviewed by the historical commission and, um approved at a public hearing. So we will, that'll come to us eventually. Um, but I did let him know about this grant opportunity, you know, as it, as it could, the timing could work well for what they need to do um, as it, the grant is due March 19th. Um, so that's one option. And, and I offered to help out with the application. Um, but there are also the town projects that 
we um, were working on that uh, CPA money was applied for that those being the town town hall steps, the roof at Munson and town hall, and I believe those are the two at this point. So happy to kind of open up the town hall roof too, right? Yeah, so the roof at Town Hall, the slate yeah. roof at Town Hall and right. Munson and Library. All right, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, is the town applying for those? And does the town, I guess my question was, does the town regularly seek out additional historic preservation funding for projects for which they've come to the CPA for funds? question mark <laughs> yeah um i'm not sure offhand just having only been with the town for over, about a year now um i i uh, looking at the grant itself you know it's there's the pool of money the pot of total pot of money is eight hundred thousand dollars and you know that's for statewide um, and the grants vary from the range of 7,500 to 100,000. So just just for a sense of the, the scale. Oh, and yeah, a 50-50 match is required as well. So um, I so, think- yeah. Robin, I, uh, the, the main uh, example that I can think of is um, the North Common project where I believe the town applied for park grants. Um, and I can't remember what the acronym stands yeah. for it. EARC, I think. Um, and, uh, and for uh, CPA funds from both, I think both in the historic preservation category and uh, also in recreation, I believe. Is that right, Jan? Um, Yes, it's like open spaces or something. Yeah, and it was there was half and half. Yeah, yeah, but I, in a way that that example seems to me to be the opposite of of looking for additional historic preservation funds for for a proposal that's already gone through through CPA. Um, in this case, I think. It, it just seemed like the town was assembling different sources of funding, knowing that no one source was going to be able to uh, cover it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, except that with the, I think with the North Common, we started with CPA and then realized the project got bigger and bigger and bigger and we added the parking lot and everything. But it seems to me because the historical commission is the one who originally put in the application for a CPA grant correct, for North Common. And then um, it was decided that it was so big, we would ask, what is it? Open spaces and leisure or whatever it's called to, to join with us. But it was originally just supposed to be CPA funded, but then it just got so big, I think, unless that was for the planning, you know, the overview project thing. So I'm not sure. Um, I guess my, question relating is just related specifically to why why would so I, you know we have I, I realize that 800,000 is not a lot of money but why would the town not seek some aspect of funding any of the projects that came before us this year I mean is it just that the competition is so tight it's not a grant that's worth going after or it's more a question for the for you know, as I'm sitting on the CPA, whether to, you know, transmit to the group that, of the, you know, there are other funds available and we'd like to see the town looking for them or they're not. And does the Conkey House just seem more attractive for the kind of grant that is there? Is it more likely to get funded? Um. I, I'm not I'm not that familiar with this grant opportunity, so I'm not sure. I mean, the oh, Nate, Nate's raising his hand. Um, Nate, you can talk. <laughs> can you... Sure, thanks. The um, hey everyone. Hi Nate. Hi Nate. 
maybe I'll start my video. I don't know if you can see me. Yeah, the, um, yeah, nice. the preservation project. <laughs> this is the preservation uh, preservation projects fund grant. I actually think that the town has received them in the past. Uh, it's been a few years, but I've I've worked on two of them, and they're a lot of work. And for right now, for very little money, in my mind, so a hundred thousand dollars. Not that it's anything to scoff at, but you have to have seventy five percent of the project costs already allocated and in hand at time of application. So, you know, even if we think a project is a certain amount, <clears throat> we'd have to have 75% already allocated, which, you know, if we, we'd have to plan for that. So in, during this grant cycle, we're not, you know, most of the projects probably don't have that money up front. They also won't reimburse for um, architect's costs or soft costs. And they require you, if you get this grant to hire an architect and do existing conditions documentation, you know, full set of plans, a preservation restriction, and any of those costs are not uh, included in the project cost or reimbursable. So I think that um, if, you know, as a final gap in funding, I think this could be a good project, but I think really then as a 50-50 match, I think it's a lot of work and time for what really isn't a lot of money. You know, a preservation restriction sometimes takes a year to get passed through Mass Historic. And then depending on what you need, um, I think for an outside organization too, they, they want the preservation restriction on the entire property. They no longer allow it to be say on a portion of property or building. So you'd encumber the whole property. I think for the town, that's not a big deal, but I do think for a private entity, um, it is a lot. So, you know, Amherst Cinema did receive something, um, uh, some, some funding through this in the past. It was a little more flexible and then the uh, funding pot was much bigger so that you know, you'd receive more money and it wasn't as competitive. Now I think it's quite competitive and a fair amount of work. So you know, my thought is if we think it's, if one of these projects that the town's applied for, for CPA funding, you know, if it's not recommended this year, but we think it's eligible, you know, we, we should recommend to the town to get money you know, in the budget now and then plan for next year, just because the way this grant cycle aligns with the town budget, you need money at hand you know, are available when you apply. So if we think a project needs, you know, 150,000 local dollars, that, you know, and we need 75%, 75 of that at the time of application, we would need that in the budget, you mm -hmm. know, next year at this time. So, okay, so I'm not so, sure any of the projects that the town applied for actually has that, um, you know, that budget ratio available. And can you explain for the layperson? Um, what that means. So when I know that when we, you know, we've the CPA has recommended these projects, but they haven't been approved by council yet, right? So that means they're not in the budget, and that's right. the problem. So we we know essentially that they're going to go forward at that dollar amount, and that the money will be there, but it's not official. Is that what I? Is that a good way of thinking right. of it? So I mean, we could maybe apply and then say that the money would be available uh, contingent on a town council approval, and the funds would be available July one, but. I don't know if um, I don't know if Mass Historic, you know, I think they really want them at the time of application. And I think what they're worried about is uh, cash flow. So because it's a reimbursement grant, I think it's reading the their um, notice of funding. It sounds like in the past some communities might have said that they would get a match, they didn't, and then they don't actually have enough money to pay for the project cost, and then you know have to ask Mass, you know, Historic maybe to reimburse. A partial reimbursement when they don't like to do that. So, okay. although it's a, in the end a 50 50 match, a community has to pay all the costs up front and then request reimbursement on half of it. And they like to see at the time of application that 75% of the total project cost has already been allocated and in hand. And I think th that's their way of seeing that the community has the ability to you know, manage cash flow on a project. Right, right. Um, can you give an example of a project that this would be a good? grant to go after for? Well, it's interesting. The, um, you know, I thought the Civil War tablets too, but then it's really about property. And so I don't know if, for instance, like the tablets would be eligible. They really want. Um, like a building. Yeah. Didn't we think, hear, was it Jeremiah that presented the roofs and everything, the steps to us? Didn't he say that there was um, money in the town budget that could be applied to those, but he wanted to apply for a CPA funding in addition. Mm -hmm. Wasn't there yeah, like, so like 80,000 or something? Right, like the outside steps on Boltwood Ave, um, for instance, or the, um, you know, on the south side of Town Hall, 
you know, then it, I think that, that that would be eligible. For instance, what Jeremiah was saying is that um, in in uh, you know for facilities, uh, buildings and facilities, the town has different line item accounts. So for town hall, there might be like seven accounts, and some of them might one might be for windows, one might be for exterior maintenance, whether that's doing brickwork or something. One might be for the steps, some might be for like just lawn care and maintenance, and he could potentially pool all those accounts and put them toward the steps, but then he would drain any, you know, any and all accounts that could be related to the town, to the town hall exterior. And so, you know, he, he, he you know, I, I kind of, I hear what he's saying. He doesn't want to take money from every possible account because what if then during the year, you know, a tree, the tree falls down outside town hall and we have to pay for someone to remove it or a window's broken, then there's no money left to, to deal with that. So, but yeah, you did say there was a, you know, I thought, right, you did say there was a pay ahead uh, and that get reimbursed the portion, right? I mean, if, wouldn't that be the kind of fund that might work that way where we'd pay it all and then get some back? It would, it would. I mean, we'd have to then just, but then at some point we'd have to be able to vote the total project cost by the time or have that money by the time this could be awarded, so. So that yeah. seems like the tricky part, right? Is that the CPA, uh, the timeline for CPA gets, you know, something gets awarded funds by the CPA and then we could ask, you know, for the reimbursement of any other grants that are received, but the CPA money isn't final until after the grant period. Is that, is it like a misalignment there? No, it's almost like, you know, you'd, um, we could have a town council vote or, you know, I think what would happen is, you know, if, for instance, some of the CPA money is voted this year, and it what you know, and the project wasn't going to get done this summer or this next con construction season, you know, and we've sat on it, then it would be eligible for next year. But I, okay. I, you know, I think that the timing, the sequencing is really difficult because, um, you know, then most communities, I don't know what most communities, you know, I thought most communities did their CPA in the fall. So maybe the idea is that MHC thinks that most communities will have already voted their CPA by the spring or by the time this application is due, so they know if the money is available. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, it's it's just that that timing sequence. And I also do think it does a lot of work. So Mass Historic has a pretty rigorous requirement for using an architect, right, and going through a bid process and you know following all these steps. And so not that we not that the town wouldn't, but you know, you have to use their RFP template and you have to go through this review criteria for proposals, which, you know, maybe depending on what project we're doing, maybe the town, Jeremiah wasn't planning on doing that type of RFP process. Maybe he was going to use another bid process. So I think we'd have to explore, you know, what's a good project and then how do we get, how would we line up all the funding and get everything ready for this type of, you know, I almost think we'd have to honestly get CPA money this spring and then just save it for next year's cycle mm -hmm. you know it's almost okay. like we have you know we'd almost have to have that overlap um unless mass historic is you know i don't know if they're i don't think we could apply and say oh but our town council is going to vote soon and right. we might have it okay yeah another option is um in thinking of historic projects uh the, the massachusetts cultural facilities fund it's it's not nearly as um right difficult and time consuming as the preservation projects fund. Um, maybe that's the one that Amherst um, Cinema received. I think they received maybe both or that one, but right. Yeah, I, I've i gotten both of them before also. And I right. agree that the preservation projects fund is very, very difficult. And that's, that's how the Evergreens came to have a <clears throat> preservation deed restriction uh, right. because of that quid pro quo. Um, <laughs> And I've gotten, I guess, three cultural facilities fund grants, and they they are they're easier. I think um, the library is planning on mm -hmm. applying for a cultural facilities fund grant, but um, you know, it seems like you know if we could figure out the location for the Civil War tablets, we that that might be. A a possibility, especially if you know if they're to go in the Jones Library, mm -hmm. um, it could be that would be an application after the Jones application. Right, and I do think that the steps of Town Hall and possibly 
the roof on the North Amherst school would also be eligible. We would just have to make sure that, you know, we'd have all the funding and then just, you know, all the other soft costs that are required, engineering mm -hmm. drawings and mm -hmm. you know, architects drawings ready. And, you know, if it's, I don't, sometimes I'm not sure, right, Jane, I don't know if it, depending on the project, is it worth the extra effort and cost to go after this for, you know, a certain project, so. It, it, yeah, I think it depends on either how, small or how large the organization is. You know, a small organization may be willing to do a lot of work for a $7,500 grant, but uh, um, I, think, mm. I think that's kind of a waste of time because it is so hard. Um, you know, the town, I, I guess the town would need to decide, you know, where the cost benefit is. You know, is it at fifty thousand or is it at seventy thousand? Um, uh, but it, yeah, the, it, no matter how much you get, it's this, the amount of work is the same. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what does it mean for the for the Conkey House if they if Scott was interested in pursuing this? Um, obviously, they they would need to put a preservation restriction on the property and kind of, I don't know if he was planning on working with an architect or engineer, probably not. Um, so I guess that might be difficult for them as well in this short, yeah, short time know, frame. Right. I don't know if it would trigger, you know, any prevailing wage or yeah. either. Yeah. I mean, I think the preservation restriction for a private entity might be off putting. So, you know, I don't know if, yeah, if they, if the condo association there would agree to a restriction on the property, but you know, that's why, for instance, uh, depending on what town property, whether it's town hall or the North Amherst school, that's to me that a restriction, well, at least on town hall is not a big deal. Cause it, I mean, the town hall did have one. I don't know if it meets the current standards of the, um, MHC's restriction, but you know, so, really you know, that. It, usually it's that that keeps private entities away from Right. That grant category, just because it, the restrictions, they feel onerous. If, you know, if you're not already committed to preservation for whatever project it is, then restrictions feel like there could be problems in the future with um, having, having to have the state review um, activities that, it, you know, you just might not think would would qualify. But Is that once uh, that's in place, it's for all time? Mm -hmm. Maybe we should encourage yeah. bar owners to apply for these funds. <laughs> and <then> they go. <laughs> but I think, you know, I mean, I guess the incentive then for the Conkey House would be, I'd say that if they apply and if they're willing to agree to a preservation restriction, then, you know, we could also say then the town has CPA funds that could be used too. And, you know, we I've, you know, I, I spoke with a previous representative from from the condo association, you know, a number of years ago, and I think Jonathan did too. And we really encouraged them to apply to the CPA um, for funding, and they they seemed interested, but they never did. So I don't, you know, it, I don't know what turned them off about that, or if it was just seemed too hard. I mean, we said we'd even help them complete the application. That you know, the preservation projects fund is much more rigorous than applying to the town for CPA. So. Yeah, if, yeah. If they're willing to do that, then I think we should encourage them also to do to seek CPA funds because yeah, because remind me, CPA funds require a preservation restriction too. They do, okay. and it used to be that we could. Um, I think we we might still be able to get away with a local preservation restriction, but more right. recently they're really saying that it should be a restriction also reviewed by Mass Historic. So, but you know, we used to just do a local preservation restriction with CPA okay. funds. Does that, does that help, Robin? Yeah, thank you. That was very informative. Um, it would, it would be, you know, back to this Marconkey house, it would be nice if they did. I mean, we, you know, their fence was removed and I had, you know, we had communicated about that a while ago and we had, I encouraged CPA funds for that and gave them the name of the, uh, a few foundries that possibly had information about, um, you know, whether it was, you know, any remaining pieces of similar fences or they, they could make a mold from something if they had a pattern, but, you know, it just didn't seem like they could, they could get it together. And I, I don't know, you know, if it was an internal 
discussions where it fell apart or if it's just, you know, it does take a lot of work to get these things done. I don't, I don't know, you know, whatever reason they just never seem to move forward with some of the things they reached out about. Uh, any other discussion of preservation projects grants? Um, is there anything anybody can think that the, well, all right. Uh, we've just talked about how difficult the, pres the preservation restriction is and how difficult the application is. So I don't know if there's anything y'all think we should be thinking about for a historical commission project. Well, I was thinking about it in terms of the projects that just came up this year, but also just in the in a sense of you know how how on the CPA we ask the appropriate questions about you know when and and how the town seeks outside funds. That's really um, you know being able to ask you know whether it's been considered or I mean the, the the I didn't realize the timing thing was an issue. That makes a lot of sense. Um, but for I mean for the north. Amherst school like that would be a big project would that be something that would be a good choice Nate yeah I mean I think the if not for this year you know would be a discussion with the town um you know it, you know what would we you know we've used block grant funding on the building but that restricts it for it's only you know five to 15 years and it has to then be used for a certain use but we're not restricting the property in perpetuity in terms of how the building needs to be maintained or look, you know, how, what it needs to look like. So, you know, I think that's why I said town hall, you know, already, we've already used, had a restriction on the building. So that, you know, that the town hall property, you know, going through that, you know, it'd be great if at mass historic said, Oh, there's already something on the town hall. You don't need to do a, a new one, but the restriction I don't think is very good. <laughs> so I think they would make us file a new one, mm -hmm. but I don't, you know, I don't see town hall changing use. You know, I, I could see where um, in the North Amherst School, the town might say, do we want a preservation restriction on the property? What if, you know, what if we wanted to demolish the back part of the building at some point and do an addition or, not that it precludes that, but I just, um, you know, but I do think the North, to me, the North Amherst School is a good one, honestly, just because it, the slate roof is original, probably original or old and the building itself has been maintained pretty well. And mm -hmm. so, um, so that would be a case where CPA funds could be awarded, but then held until a preservation projects grant organized. Is that how that would work? Yeah, I mean, more than likely that this, the timing of this year doesn't work out because we don't have the funding, you know, any funding or any, you know, plans drawn up. So I think we'd have to you know, if we were, if we wanted to go after this type of this grant, we'd have to then plan for next year and say, okay, what are the steps to apply and make it competitive? You know, and is, you know, and, you know, we have, the town has to go through public procurement, but, you know, was Jeremiah going to hire an architect to draft up the plans or were we just going to have a slate roofer come and just re-roof it because, you know, there were no changes. So, you know, they require an architect if you get these grants to create plans. And so, you know, we had plans for the steps because they were going to be taken down, but, you know, the roofing project almost seemed like uh, it could be done with a scope of work and not necessarily plans. Um, so, you know, like, is that added cost worth it? You know, if it costs us 20,000 for an architect, but we get this much as, you know, it, we still would make, mo you know, we'd still receive more money from the grant, but is all that extra effort, you know, worth it for that project? Right. Uh, that's why I still think the steps on Main Street or on Boltwood from Town Hall would be good because we need an architect. You know, it's a pretty discreet project. You know, the roofs were so expensive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they really were. Kind of shocking. Not that we couldn't use a grant for that, but you know, the steps are pretty, dis you know, they're, we could say, okay, it's a $150,000 project. We want Mass Historic to give us 75. We have a hundred thousand already allocated and we apply and it's a pretty, you know, small, you know, it's a, to me, it's a, something you could bundle or make it, you know, make it feasible. Yeah. And I think, I mean, there are already architect drawings from, uh, for the town hall steps, which is a, right. a major bonus for that. Yeah. 
But I don't, yeah, I don't know about the funding. I, I, I emailed Ben, Robin, he forwarded your email to me the other week or a few weeks ago. And I just said, the funding is kind of the tricky part. Mm -hmm. you know, we don't have that 75% project cost already allocated. Right. Well, thank you. That was very interesting and informative. So that part of the conversation was helpful in advancing the CPA end of the conversation about looking for matching funds, right? I mean, yep. Yeah. And then, so is there anything we want to, to do or recommend about um, uh, preservation projects fund application for the for the steps. So do we, we can rec recommend it, but the town would have to participate and yeah. agree. Yeah, the town would have to do all the work, pretty much. So, <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, so Nate, what your feeling is that, that this is, is a potential, uh, a project that potentially could garner a grant? Well, I was just thinking that, you know, the steps are a pretty discrete project. Right. You know, so that it could work. Whereas, you know, like the roof on the North Amherst school is, is you know, the, pro the Mass Preservation Projects Fund will fund up to 100,000, that's the ceiling. So, you know, maybe it's 75,000 is their average award. But I think for the for the steps, you know, that might be half the project cost. So it, to me, it's worthwhile. And then also putting a restriction on the town hall property, you know, encumbering it with a preservation restriction is not an issue. But for other town properties, it may be because you know, would the town want to keep the building in that historic form for in perpetuity? You know, there's probably maybe a few other properties in town that the town would be willing to do that with. But you know, I can't say that every you know, town property, we'd want to have a hundred, you know, 99 year or, or, you know, a preservation restriction on in perpetuity. So what is our role here then recommending that that would be a viable project to seek um, a mass preservation projects grant? Well, I, um, so the, the question of the preservation restriction, I, I kind of think that's, out of our hands. I think that's, wouldn't that be more of a town manager or town council decision? It would. Yeah. Maybe, you know, maybe the, maybe the commission would say that, you know, really encourage the town to look at this for some of the projects that are going through CPA now as, you know, possible matching funds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll, well, I'll that, yeah. That would be for next year, though, right? Because we would need the funds in hand. Right, right. I'm just, yeah, I'm trying to quickly read through Mass Historic's information just to see. And Nate, if we were to get one of the grants, would that restore funds to the CPA? Only if, um, you know, it all depends, right? Yeah, so we always say that if a project comes in under budget, then, you know, we spend the grant first, and then whatever's left gets uh, put back to CPA, so... Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, ostensibly, if if you know we receive say seventy five thousand dollars and um, you know from this grant for a project, and we had put you know all the CP, you know, it's basically going to be funded all by CPA. Then yeah, seventy five thousand dollars, you know, could be potentially given back to CPA. Okay. And then, but would it 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 would go back into a general CPA fund? Oh yeah, yeah. It just goes back to the general fund. It doesn't go back to uh, historic preservation yeah. specifically. It just goes back to the general fund, and then you know, next the next grant year, it just gets, you know, as part of the total revenue that the CPA committee has. It doesn't. It's not earmarked for historic preservation. So I think. I mean, I guess to me, my. I guess I'm thinking that the historical commission's interest in this would be to stretch historic preservation dollars from CPA or that's or, or enable the town to do additional um, historic preservation work. Right. 
and I'm not sure how that shakes down in this particular situation. Well, it would still be, I mean, in, if there was a grant, it would still be, it would have a positive impact on CPA overall, which would trickle down to historic preservation. I mean, it would mean that, you know, in that case that there would what be $75,000 more, I mean, um, allocated so that might end up going to historic preservation depending on the grants for that year. It's not, you know, it's not fixed, but it's still a positive outcome. So perhaps our, so sort of getting this in the proper sequence with what CPA is doing, I mean, could the historical commission could uh, recommend to, as Nate, I think you were saying, recommend to town council um, entertaining the possibility of um, grant applications to offset historic preservation costs um, in general, just as a general recommendation. Or we could let the CPA committee run through its um, kind of criteria, its uh, sort of policy about um, looking for matching funds in each of the funding areas and then make a recommendation. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I'm not sure what I was, you know, I, I think, I guess my thought would be, you know, it could be a recommendation for the CPA committee to remind the town and others that there's this, you know, different outside funding sources, and this is one of them. I was just trying to read quickly on the Mass Historic website, though. I do think you have to have the money voted by the time of application. So, you know, the, our timing, our cycle almost every year then wouldn't, yeah. you know, unless council vote CPA recommendations, you know, earlier than, you know, or if it's really later in the season, we may, if they are going to do like a two cycle request, we apply in the fall, but right now the timing doesn't seem to match up. Okay. Um, so, you know, it's just a question of if there are other, if this funding source is available, you know, is it okay then for the, uh, a town, um, the town or another applicant to sit on CPA money to apply for this, you know, six months, eight months after getting the CPA funding? Mm -hmm. um, I, will, I will say one thing, one thing on the Mass Historic website and FAQs for this grant, they did say that a preservation restriction, they say an MPPF, a Mass Preservation Projects Fund restriction, covers both the interior and exterior of a structure as well as the property. Uh. So mm -hmm. I think, again, for the town, for some properties, not a big deal, but like, you know, the Ithmar Conkey house, I could see that they would not <laughs> want a preservation restriction, especially on the interior of the property. If that meant, you know, they're going to end up having to ask Mass Historic if they're changing the interior. <laughs> that just seems yeah. like a... The, the wording used to be uh, for major changes in the interior. And it, it, it so it, there was a list of what it considered major changes and a list of what it considered minor changes. Um, yeah, they still might. I just, you know, I haven't read through the document closely enough if that's still the case, right? Yeah, but still yeah, it's... I mean, that's, I think, one of the most off-putting things about it is governing interior changes. Yeah, I know the women's list club. Of what they, do they have a list of what they consider exterior major and minor changes? It might be useful for our bylaw. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yeah, let me uh, come up with better. <laughs> I've downloaded their uh, their PDF. Let me see if they have any, if they have a. Uh... <laughs> we were trying they... to find how specific to be, you know. Right. So for a project like the steps, I mean, in, is it something that the town keeps in mind that, oh, well, you know, if it's not a rush and the CPA funds have been allocated for it, then it's something that you could hold until the funds are in hand for the next round. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. you just have to think strategically, right? For any project that gets approved by CPA, you'd want to consider whether you'd want to come around. But I see your point about the, the preservation restriction too, that makes it even more limiting. Well, we all know it's possible to hang on to CPA funds for a long time. Look at the Yeah, I was going to mention that too. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't seem to be a problem. <laughs> yeah, they're, um, I can send you the restriction guidelines. They actually don't, they define minor and major exterior changes, but they don't 
uh, you know, they have their categories are paint, windows and doors. They don't, they don't, um, you know, differentiate between like interior, exterior doors. Then they have exterior landscape, outbuildings, walls, partitions, and then HVAC, but they don't have an interior category. Those are major? Those are the main, those are their category. So for instance, for exterior, a minor change, which they would allow would be spot repair of existing cladding, roofing, including in-kind replacement of clapboards, shingles, slates, et cetera. Major is a large scale repair or replacement of cladding or roofing, change involving inappropriate removal or addition of materials or building elements, such as removal of chimneys or cornice detailing, installation of architectural detail, which does not have a historical basis, altering or demolishing building additions, spot repointing of masonry, structural stabilization of the premises is also considered a major alteration. So, mm -hmm. in, to me partitions. that's- oh. Wouldn't partitions be interior? Is there any more under that? So partitions, they just say walls partitions. Minor is making fully reversible changes such as sealing off doors in situ, leaving doors and door openings fully exposed to the spatial arrangement of a non-significant portion of the building. Major alteration under walls or partitions is creating new openings in walls or permanently sealing off existing openings, adding permanent partitions which obscure a significant original room arrangement, demolishing existing walls, removing or altering stylistic features, altering primary staircases. There is some useful language in there for our bylaw, the way that they talk about major changes for the exterior. We might be able to sneak a bit. Yeah, I do think that, again, for like the town hall, you know, it went through a major renovation. We didn't move the staircase. You know, we didn't try not to um, change the major hallways, but we did change room layout. So it's kind of interesting, you know, if, there, if this res preservation restriction were on town hall and they decided, well, they, we just did it on the first floor to add an office and then have a private, you know, another room that's private for say HR to have, you know, doors that are closed because it's all open. You know, essentially we'd almost have, we'd have to go to Mass Historic and ask for their review and approval to do that. That's a lot for a private organization. Yeah, it is. But that's a, an important point that uh, these major minor changes are what what needs to be reviewed by Mass Historic. In other words, minor changes don't need to be re reviewed. Right, they don't. But right. major changes. Mm -hmm. and, and they may approve the, the major changes or, or not. Right. But it's kind of time consuming. Um, so have we sort of talked ourselves around to what? <laughs> Suggesting that, um, uh, that we that we um, empower Robin to carry our our recommendation that applicants or successful applicants look for alternate sources of funding, and this being one of them, additional yeah. sources. Of funding. Additional so yeah, sorry. Yeah. Looking so for match uh, matching funds, some sort. Is that That's for me? Have I got this? <laughs> have I got the sense of the conclusion correct there? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Okay. Well, since we've discovered helpful language for the demolition delay bylaw, why don't we move to that? And thank, thank thanks, you. Nate. Thank you, Nate. And are yeah. you going to? Are you going to say? I don't. You know, I think we can let the town know that this is a possibility. I, I just I'm looking through the document. It is really. They do ask a lot. You know, we have to have an existing conditions assessment to apply, and not that the town wouldn't do that for certain historic projects, but I think the cost applying for this for certain projects would add to the cost. And you have to have an architect. You can't, you know, someone one of the FAQs was like, "Well, can I just? It's a really simple project. Do I need an architect?" And they're like, "Yes." And you need engineered plans and stamp drawings, and it's just, you know, they almost get in the way of themselves if they require that for. <coughs> Okay. Are you going to stick around for the bylaw thing, or do you want to send us that language? 
Oh no, I can. Uh, I'll stick around. Great. I'll send it to Ben. Great. Great. Okay. Well, thanks for the, the cleaned up version, Ben. And um, let's see, where are we? Uh, the bylaws. Where did we get to here? In the bylaw. Are are we at the point of reviewing the whole thing after? Uh, we been we needed a few definitions. Okay. Okay, I think especially the one about, you know, what is demolition? Yeah, yeah, so basically, um, I have it open here now, sorry. Um, I think, yeah, looking closely at definitions would be a good place to start and then reviewing the kind of overall process and see if we can clean that up at all. Um, and then addressing the, there's also the kind of um, clarifying the significance criteria would also be good. Let me um, let me share my screen now. Yeah, I think I was here because you know staff, planning staff, and the building commissioner reviewed the the bylaw, mm -hmm. and you know I think you know staff had a number of questions. Um, you know, I think the thought was too, we'd like to work together with the commission to present a bylaw that when it goes to council, both, um, you know, the community resource committee and town council, is something that, the st you know, staff and the historical commission agree on and support, because I think, you know, maybe a question of who's supporting this, who's sponsoring it, but it'd be nice to say that, you know, it, it there's agreement, at least on the, on the draft that's being reviewed by these different boards and committees, uh, because I think, you know, they're, you know, they're going to take a hard look at it too. And then they're going to ask staff, like, how, what do we think of it? You know, what is, how does the building commissioner interpret this and how is it going to work functionally? And so I think, you know, what I think Ben had presented last meeting, you know, was like questions and concerns of staff or suggestions or I'm not sure what it's titled, but, mm -hmm. you know, I think, yeah, I think there was, um, I think there were a few pieces. Some of it were, right, the definitions of certain things, you know, um, of demolition and building you know, then with the procedure, I think the change of going to a two-step process was um, staff felt that the having staff determine significance wasn't necessarily, um, you know, it was feasible. It's just that they thought there was not enough time. And then there was a question about, well, how much research is expected? Um, you know, is it borne all by staff? Mm -hmm. And then they thought that, um, in terms of the public hearing, you know, if you're looking at a preferably preserved designation, there really needed to be clear criteria in the bylaw because the concern was that a lot of criteria was put under significance, but that's being done by staff and not really being done at a public hearing. So some of it was, you know, could some of those um, criteria or others be used also during the determination or could they be, you know, what what's more appropriate in terms of um, criteria? So some staff thought that some of the criteria for determining significance could actually work for determining preferably preserved. And then there's simpler criteria for determining significance, you know, so that it's not a, a big point of deliberation uh, between staff and the historical commission designee. You know, I think those were, you know, those were like the big pieces. Um, you know, there's some questions about the length of the delay, you know, the change of ownership piece and different ways to address some of the, you know, pieces of the bylaw, but um, and one thing I, I said, which I liked, which I think wasn't under consideration was that the commission would actually be issuing their own, you know, permit with right. this review. So if this is moved to the general bylaw that this is no longer, the commission's action is no longer a, a recommendation to the building department to issue a building permit to demolish. It's actually, the commission would be issuing whatever we want to call it, like a certificate to demolish or a permit to demolish. And, you know, what that does is it really takes, it really takes it out of zoning and it really takes it out of, um, uh, what, what it does right now is it, it kind of confuses the way it even in this revised bylaw, it confuses it that, you know, it's not a zoning piece we're doing, but then all of a sudden it's a zoning action that the building commissioner does to issuing a permit and the, the historical commission's decision isn't really appealable. And so an applicant or an abutter has to wait for the building permit to be issued. And to me, it's kind of confusing because 
right now when, it, when an application comes in, we actually are having them fill out a building permit application to demolish mm -hmm. as part of the demolition application. And so it's, you know, we have them pay a building permit, uh, a building permit fee as part of this. And it's somewhat confusing. So we would actually just separate out that completely and just say you're applying first step is to apply for a demolition, whatever you want to call it. Certificate. Yeah. Certificate or, you know, and it's really clear that they're not even yeah. submitting a building permit application. And, you know, then the commission's process is a standalone process with a decision at the end and, you know, whatever we want to call it. But I think that to me that, you know, really makes it a clear process and doesn't confuse, you know, is it, who's issuing this? Is it the building permit? And then that's appealable to the zoning board of appeals. Like we're not, you know, my thought is we just take it all out of zoning and it's in the general bylaw. Um, mm -hmm. So staff, I know that's interesting. We're gonna have to completely rework this whole thing if we do that. I mean, it makes uh, no. Sense. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think I actually think the process and everything, the timeline, all that is all fine. I think what we would do is we'd have to just change a definition or two, and then have um, a few sentences in the narrative in different sections explaining what's happening. And honestly, it really reads like the local historic district bylaw. You know, we can take some of that language and use it. Um, but I don't think we have to. I think the bylaw itself wouldn't have to be reworked very much to make that happen. It's really so. centered around what the building commissioner does though. And that would, that would be dropped out, right? Yes, yep, yeah. So the role of the building There's commissioner would, would be minimized or, or as he still could be in there. But I think the difference is we're no longer relying on the building commissioner as the zoning enforcement officer to make interpretations or things. That would just, that could be staff. It could be the chair of the commission with staff. And so we may wanna clarify those roles, but um, you know, we still could have the building commissioner in there. Just, mm -hmm. I think some of it is that we used a draft that was probably a little bit from zoning. So we're, you know, we're kind of, we have kind of these relic phrases and language that is actually pulled from like what would be a zoning, you know, a piece that's in a zoning bylaw. Well, for instance, in the first paragraph, our purpose paragraph, we say to achieve these purposes, the historical commission is authorized to advise the building commissioner with respect mm -hmm. to demolition permit applications. Would that still be true? No, mm -hmm. we'd be saying to achieve these purposes, the historical commission is authorized to grant demolition permit applications, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. So it would be much more direct then. Right. Right. And then I guess it's a question for the commission. I just think that Um, you know, we can make it, we could, you know, either one works, but it's just, you know, if someone's applying now, they'd be applying, say, for the, um, you know, I would say we don't even use the word demolition and we call it, you know, instead of a demolition permit, we call it something else because that, I think, confuses it with a building permit. You know, we could call it a, I don't know what we call I, it, but. I think we were talking about the whole thing being, being, um, Preservation, mm -hmm. right? And so, what if we what, what would we call the demolition permit then? Maybe uh, maybe just call it a demolition oh, permit. But <laughs> I mean, it could be like a historic certificate or something. Or yeah. well, um, for allowing them to take something down, then it's not preserved. So it's the opposite right. of preserved. It's like so, it's like um. Well, the local districts have certificates. And what are they yeah. called? I'm trying to remember. Oh, certificate of appropriateness. Right. 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 And ours is awkward. certificate of inappropriateness. Yeah, that's awkward. Um, well, I think um, if 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 everyone's okay with the this overarching concept, I think Nate and I can rework the bylaw to meet those that goal, and mm -hmm. we can work on. Uh, taking some language from local historic district bylaw and anything new that we have to do, we can rework the bylaw to meet that goal. But um, maybe as a tonight, we should focus on kind of the the right. meat of the bylaw being the, um, I guess, kind of the, some of the issues Nate raised and that staff raised were the um, yeah, kind of, I, I don't want to repeat exactly what Nate said, but essentially the 
you know, significance criteria versus preferably preserved criteria, the, the length of the, of the delay and the um, demolition definition, I think is worth discussing tonight. Okay, but at some point, we still have to do a really careful fine tooth combing because I've, I went through it this afternoon. There are some very awkward sentences that came out of our working in a committee. Okay. You know, they're yeah. just, they don't make a lot of sense or they're, they're all twisted. So I've been trying to clean these up and have them much more direct. Uh, and that can be done separately. I can send you, I can just do it and send it to you, or we can have another meeting where we go through it line by line, but that still has to be done too. It won't be done. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think we could, if that, if that were sent to Ben, he could just, you know, put it in track changes and then that just becomes easier to review. But yeah, I mean, even when you set up there, Jan, about the purpose, you know, we could make that change and make it right more direct. The commission is authorized to issue or deny a, you know, a demolition permit and that's it, you know, and that's, and that's very clear. Um, and, and that's not using the word demolition there doesn't, it seems appropriate to me because yeah, that's think, what the request is. Yeah, if that's what we're calling it. I think that's how we that's define we it, it. Yeah, we could call it something else. Yep. So but, yeah, I think but, for, yeah. In terms of clarity, I think when we, when I joined the, the process of doing this, it was to make it um, add clarity and, and transparency for the public um, mm -hmm. as, and the applicant. And so we should call a spade a spade. Um, demolition is demolition. <laughs> if, we, if we give it a fancy name, it's going gonna, it's gonna to obfuscate what they're asking for, my opinion. Well, maybe demolition request is, I mean, we don't even have to settle right. on what the, uh, right. what the final document is. It can just be a demolition. No, it's a, oh. it's a request for demolition. Okay. And, and we can and, just say, it, we can, we can uh, approve or deny demolition, period. Yeah. No, no permit right. needed. Right. Yeah, so I think, you know, once question staff had been related, if we go into the definitions, one is the building definition. So, you know, we had tried to come up with a, the commission had a pretty simple definition. The uh, building commissioner seemed like that was, could be easily interpreted, you know, it wasn't. But then, you know, the question became, you know, like fences or other structures. So, you know, at one point we had, there was a definition for structure and then for building, but if you eliminate the definition for structure and it's only a building, you know, then the question becomes, uh, you know, what is it okay if other things are then just excluded from review because it's not a building? And so, but under uh, demolition, we lim we 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 extend that out, Nate. But that's but I think that's that so that's that, but that becomes an inconsistency in the bylaw then. So I think okay. You know, I think so. Then, right. So then, there was we had a big discussion about what a, what the definition of demolition was, and so you know, one question was we have a two part definition for demolition. You know, did you, would you have a two part definition for building or have another? How how about we work on a on one at a time? Right. Uh, mm -hmm. So you just want building to allow for for fences. Right. Well, right now the bylaw, you know, really, I mean, it can be anything, you know, they describe it as like any edifice or structure that's basically attached to the ground. So it could be public art, it could be tables, it could be, you know, if, you, if you're going to interpret it as it's written, it's basically, uh, you know, almost anything. I don't necessarily want that, but, you no. know, we were saying, well, you know, there are, um, there are things other than buildings, you know, it, it could be, you know, fences was one that is a structure that is can be significant or visually significant to a property. You know, we're looking at the Clark, you know, the Clark House, the one that Amherst College took down on, um, you know, and so is, you know, for instance, would we want, you know, some homes might have this, you know, I, I, you know, I don't know what, I can't think of anything else, but. Didn't we, didn't we already discuss this? And yeah, I think last meeting we decided if there was a fence or some other piece of uh, structure besides that's not covered by this, then, you know, the, we could look at 
doing looks like some sort of local historic district to cover that, you know, or, you know, it might have just been uh, something that, that we could compromise on and say. The word shelter to enclosure. There's also a discussion about um, needing, yeah, needing a different tool like a local historic district, but um, I think there was a suggestion of, a, of another bylaw that could cover walls, fences, and um, subterranean features. Mm -hmm. And right now I can't remember if that was the suggestion of um, Chris Skelly. But for instance, um, would we want to just put walls and fences in here as a you know a you know as part of the definition of building, or do we call it a structure? And then we you know I mean I just think that the way it's written now, if this bylaw were in place, the removal of any fence would not be subject to review by this bylaw. What about using the word enclosure instead of structure that includes fences? Um, when I asked. So when Ted, when I first came on the commission and Ted was working on this and he found the demolition delay bylaw guy from the Mass Historic Commission, um, in there they, they suggest not including things like fences in the demolition delay bylaw. And when I saw Chris Skelly at a um, training, I asked him about that because it was just reference to other, other tools are better suited for that and the answer to the other tools was historic districts that for some reason just that was the information that i got that the, the, yeah. the mass historic commission doesn't recommend putting fences and structures like they they prefer the word building they recommend building and that if you want to protect things like fences you use uh local historic districts i might have misspoken there mm -hmm. um I don't know quite the logic for that, but that's, um, those are the pieces that I know. Yeah. I mean, the other thing too is for a fence, not everyone, it's not obvious to people, to most people that they would need to submit a demolition application, I wouldn't think. So it'd be hard to even catch a lot of those. Right. Um, so it's more of a proactive identifying a yeah. historic fences ahead of time, protecting them in historic yeah. district and going from there. So I think if the commission is, if everyone's okay with this definition as it is, um, I think, you know, looking at other towns bylaws, this is kind of the standard language for defining a building. Um, I wouldn't want to get too hung up on this. Um, I think the, I think we, we in, as staff, we were just trying to think about is there a way to broaden it um, because of, you know, uh, thinking about historic fences, but if it's not a major concern and if it's going to cause more <laughs> more uh, confusion and complication, then maybe we could just leave it as it is. Can we do a, this includes architectural detail on the property of fences, uh, you know, uh, whatever. And there are other there are other architectural details on properties that are historic, mm -hmm. but but um, just to add to that, this includes historic fences. I'm trying to think of what else you want to say. Yeah, I, mean, I feel like it really is just fences. <laughs> yeah, maybe yeah, right. If there were like verandas or pergolas or other, I mean, you know, I don't. Right. Don't, right. There could be gateways, right. stone gates and things. Yeah. The pergolas is a, you know, that could be a historic feature on a property uh, in addition to a fence. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a, it's a shelter. It comes under the definition. Some think, could argue that though, Jan, don't you think? Maybe. It's, it's not really a shelter. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's an architectural feature. But it's just separate from the the building. So it's very much driven, though, by what kind of architectural styles and movements you're you're really considering. Because for some people, you know, they're 
thinking about a kind of integration of architecture and landscape. And it may be that this, what we're trying to impose here is something that will work, but it totally depends on how, how the nature of the landscape, the land itself, you know, is shaped by, by design. And um, maybe for that reason, the word building is a little bit more straightforward um, or transparent to use Pat, um, Pat's word. It's just, it just is clearer, you know, that, that, that it's either this or it's that, you know, and not mm -hmm. something that's more sort of integrated for want of a better word. Um, because we've eliminated the, the term structure from definitions, um, could we use it here? Uh, for persons, animals, or property, including structures such as fences, stone walls, pergolas. Uh, that's so follies, I, your follies. I take your point, Hetty. Uh, so I'm not trying to. Um, no, no, no. I'm. Uh, you know. <laughs> uh, ignore it. I just the that word structure just popped into mind again, and mm -hmm. and I think I think the the shelter for persons, animals, or property is is too concrete for some to understand that we mean these other things as well. In my opinion is better to state them. Again, include, including structures, but not limited to, uh, such as fences, stone walls, yeah. and pergolas. <laughs> so is garages um, in this category too? One be. would think. Forms would, of shelter. Forms especially of shelter. De especially <laughs> detached ones. <laughs> a shelter for property. I mean, it is interesting. There was a house, you know, North Amherst a number of years ago that had a number of outbuildings, you know, like a corn crib, um, you know, just other, these other structures that maybe you could argue that it was forming shelter for animals or property, but they, you know, maybe they'd say they're nothing, but as an assemblage of um, structures, it was, you know, it, it showed what, you know, was uh, an older farm, farm buildings. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's interesting. I, I agree. So I, it, I think it's really difficult to say in this in this context, you know, maybe only certain fences or stone walls will will you know apply, right? Because I mean, you have to you have to write it pretty generically. And how do you make that decision? You, how do you define variables? Um, Hetty, to your point, you know, I agree. Some fences you, people might just be like, oh, that's not a big deal. But then there are these fences <laughs> that really contribute to the property and to the architecture. But it's hard to capture that in language. Uh, in the but, definition. But at least by saying it, Nate, you get an opportunity to evaluate. Right. right. Fence. And do we want to add outbuildings then to, to this, but not limited? I'm wondering if we should have building or like um, a whole, what do you, what would you call a whole assemblage of buildings? You know, because you might have, like you said, a corn crib, an ice house, a smokehouse, all these things, chicken coop, you know, that might be historically important in terms of the larger context. Then so his building or historically whatever. important outbuildings. Well, you would or, say you or estate structures. Yeah. Um, but I can't think of many places like that in Amherst. I mean, I think uh, I think we need to kind of my feeling is we need to sort of remember where we are um, and uh, sort of, you know, what is the scope? What, is, what are the outer limits of, this, of, of the kinds of structures and buildings that we have um, and, and sort of work from there? Um, you know, we're not talking about an Edward, an Edwin Lutchens estate. We're not talking about McKim, Mead and White. Um, in, you know, we, I think, I think some of this is, is you know, is a bit more. Yeah. yeah. But there would be nothing lost if we took the end out from before pergolas and added <laughs> um, 
uh, historic outbuildings. Yeah, that's I like that a lot. I think that actually is a sort of that captures a lot of uh, whether the whether the people you know dealing with the what bylaw feel that way. I don't know, but yeah. Well, I mean, I think outbuildings are already covered. You know, they re they routinely come to the commission, but um, but. But they're not stated anywhere in here. This, this this list isn't stated anywhere in here. And then there's there's no confusion that if someone looks at the demolition bylaw, what they need a permit for. Mm -hmm. And my, people might think that, well, a lot of people don't think their barns count. It's clear here a barn does, but maybe if we said something like including assorted outbuildings or something, they'd know that it went beyond just the main barn. You know, I'm just, I've been reading that book, Big House, Little House, Back House, Barn, you know, and there's all those little buildings in between the barn and the house that we might want to preserve, especially if it's a classic example of that. And it doesn't, they don't really have specific names anymore because they aren't being used to their original purpose. But if we said something like assorted or whatever word you could come up with, it would let people know that we don't just mean their barn or their garage. I mean, I think outbuildings right now you want to qualify it maybe but to me i think if you know if a staff person were to interpret that they would just say okay it's an outbuilding you know any outbuilding then is would be right. at least right we need to be so say including any outbuildings <laughs> <laughs> I like we're making it we're making it plural so it's it's you know it's inclusive of any outbuilding that would be on any property that they're seeking demolition for any type of outbuilding? You want to say something like that or just say any outbuilding, period? I think just saying outbuilding says it. Well, but you're going from singular for the definition to plural. Well, we have fences, walls. Well, it's oh, we're saying all those things? I thought we were just saying these other, okay. No. I, I, think, I think we could remove pergolas. Oh, I see you're doing it. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I, I do consider that, that an outbuilding. Well, are we avoiding what, using the word shed <laughs> or shack? <laughs> love shacks, love shacks, that kind of thing. You know, I mean, that's an outbuilding. Yeah. Okay. It's also, it's also a shelter for property. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, yeah, I was thinking that you know, outbuildings can be other things too, right? That some people may argue are not, and I, I don't, you know, and I, I think. If we keep this, these changes, whether we keep pergola or not, I, you know, again, we can bring it back to staff and the building commissioner and, and ask for the opinion. Okay, how do they? How is this interpreted? Um, so let's leave pergolas in. Or well, greenhouses. I would take them both out and let outbuilding cover them. Yeah, just outbuildings, right? Yeah, that's all you need. I mean, it's getting a bit much. Because you can think of twenty-five other things if you start really going this into that much detail. You know and outbuildings okay or outbuildings maybe it should say or well but it's including it doesn't matter okay okay well, shall we tackle the next difficult um, under application i just wanted to say that it's weird the way we say a form created by the building commissioner for the demolition of it'd be a form to request a permit for demolition the form doesn't make a demolition. It's just an awkward definition, I think. Okay, yeah, um, that might end up changing when Nate and I kind of- That might just be a form to request a permit for demolition. No, yeah, I like that, I like that. Yeah, again, and, and if we're changing this to be a commission process, we would just get rid of the building commissioner altogether, so. Yeah. And it wouldn't have to say a demolition of a building, it should just say for demolition because it could be for any number of things, but it doesn't really matter, right? So do we need to say where it's where it's retrieved? If not if from the building commissioner, from whom? Well, we say that elsewhere. This is just the definition of what an application is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. We say above that we're authorizing this, so. So then with the, you know, with the definition of demolition, I think, you know, particularly the building commissioner, you know, because there's, you know, again, with building and then demolition, there's differences between, you know, building code and what we're interpreting, but, you know, there are a lot of questions 
about how do you determine or measure a 25% or any, any threshold. And so it was just more about, you know, the commission can come up with its own. Is it 25% of the exterior envelope? Is it 25% of the footprint? And they all have different implications, but it was really about how to qualify uh, some of the some of the terms in this demolition definition, just so that you know there isn't you know right now the way this was you know if someone was reading this we could say you know two different staff people could have different interpretations of what twenty five percent mean, and so Ben, you sent us some good. At uh, examples. Yeah, yeah, I do. I have those up right now. If we want to look at those, uh, I found three other towns that consider <laughs> partial demolition, um, and I found their bylaws um, as sample language. Um, let me see here. So, what we have now is uh, removing or raising 25% or more of any facade of a building visible from the public right of way. So that those are the changes we made last meeting. Um, and I think facade is misleading because that's only one side. I would say any side of a building visible from the public right of way. Right, so let me, um, with that in mind, let me, um, how do I get this back? So I'll share my, so we have Arlington, Pittsfield, and I forget the third, but this is Arlington, their bylaw. So when they do demolition, same thing as us, act of pulling down, destroying, or removing or raising a building, commencing the work of total substantial destruction. Um, they talk about failure to maintain a watertight and secure structure. And then finally, they, they say a structure shall also be considered to be demolished if more than 25% of the front or side elevations are removed or covered. Each elevation shall be calculated separately. So that's- that final a, line is good. Yeah, that's essentially what we say. Um, we don't, we not say- real, Not, 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 I, but not I disagree really. because when we talked with Rob then, right? I mean, I think they would take the 25% from the total, if we did it the way we read the, the historical draft, it was almost like 25% of the entire um, side, right? You know, we're aggregating it, but this is really clear yeah. to me, an elevation, um, a front side or elevation, and then each elevation be, is calculated separately is really clear. So that means if it's, you know, I like I like the term elevation also. Uh, yeah. Just to side because there can be, you know, slightly different elevations on a side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What else do you have, Ben? Yeah. Um, let's see. We also have this is Dartmouth. That's what it is. Um, let's see. A substantial portion. Okay. Wait. So that okay. They have the total demolition up here um, or intent of doing the same or removal of the building from its site with the intent to relocate it to another site. That's interesting. They say a substantial portion or substantial destruction of a building is defined as either half the volume of the building or half of its value as determined by the building commissioner. A building shall be considered to be demolished if more than 25% of the front, back, or side elevations are removed or covered so as to substantially obliterate the original design. Each elevation shall be calculated separately. And so, I like so that. I... this is, yeah, so they're essentially defining a substantial portion, which they use up here. Um, and then this paragraph is almost its own thing. It's, it's a clarification that demolition means 25% of the elevations. They don't say what are, that are visible. They just say back or si front, back or side. So they don't care whether they're visible or not. We've always said it had to be visible from the street. Yep. That's a big difference. Yeah, and I mean, uh, our first Arlington case they only said front and front or side yeah. here they're saying uh front back or side so that could come in if it's a building that you can see a lot of the back of mm -hmm. 
Right. If you don't say that, then, you know, even, you know, because we define the front and side, you know, that's pretty clear, but, you know, building that's visible from the back, like, you know, say uh, houses on Cosby street could be visible from fearing, but mm -hmm. if, you know, you're not defining the rear of the structure or identifying that the back of the structure is under review, then, you know, they could put a big addition on or something. Well, if we say any side of a building, that means any of the four sides. Do you think that's not clear and you'd have to say front, back or side? I, go, I don't think the one, the one, um, um, yeah, what else, Ben, what are the other towns? I mean, I do like the idea of saying a, an elevation in each side, each one. Yeah. Elevation of any side of a building. Yeah, I like Yeah, that. so then uh, Pittsfield, um, any act of pulling down, destroying, removing, dismantling, or raising, or commencing the work of total or substantial destruction with the intent of completing the same. Substantial herein shall mean either half of the volume of the structure or half of its assessed value as determined by the building inspector. So that means it's vo volume based or value based. Um, Seems so vague and it's all subjective that's, that's, on what the building inspector says. It yeah. The the value is tough. The value, yeah, the value is really hard too because that's tough. Um, yeah. the assessor too doesn't do a full valuation every year. And so um, that actually came into play with um, an Amherst College property a few years ago, um, because the way it's assessed on a campus, it actually, I think they complained <laughs> because we had to assess that very little. And then their insurance company, I think has some questions, but it's just, you know, it's so interesting, the value repeat. I, I'm surprised that they can get away with saying it's value. Um, and that is yeah. very hard to judge. So, all right, let's maybe not use Pittsfield as our example, but... Um... <laughs> Dartmouth and Arlington definitely have some interesting ideas. So are we all in favor of maybe repurposing this line about each elevation shall be calculated separately? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. And you can say 25% or more of the elevation of any side of a building visible from the public right away with each elevation be calculated separately. Mm-hmm. I think this could be our opportunity to delete visible from the public way. You think? Okay. Uh, yeah. Because if we're saying any of them, I guess, yeah. It, it doesn't need to be visible. We're. I, I would be in favor of that. Yeah. yeah. That sounds good. Gives us a little more control. Okay, here, I'm gonna see how this works. So uh, you start with of the elevation. Oh, you're trying to put something in. Okay. Yeah, so of 25% or more of the front, back or side elevations, whoops. So as to that. Of any side of a building comma with each elevation to be calculated separately. Mm -hmm. Oops. We're not doing the substantially obliterate the original design, are we? I I wasn't thinking that, but um that's just coming off of somebody else's stuff. Yeah, okay. Um yeah, we don't have to. Uh what is what did Arlington say? Did they say that? No, they don't really say that. They say removed or covered. What does that mean by covered? Does that mean if they put an addition on, then yeah, it... or, yeah, they you know they can put vinyl siding over anything, or if you enclose a porch, maybe you um, mm -hmm. put a porch on over the side of a, the front of a building. <clears throat> you could so have what's, that what's wrong with obliterating the original design? Because that covers all of the things you just mentioned, Nate. But I think, but we, the, the difference is that this definition begins any act of pulling down, destroying, removing, or raising. So oh, those other okay. definitions didn't have those. Do you want to add or covering? Yeah, or covering. Raising yeah. or covering. Yeah, I like that. So covering should probably go before raising. Yeah, okay, so covering. 
So I think we still, sorry, this is getting complicated with the list here, but uh, we, I think we still need this clause or the, or to initiate the work of total destruction with mm -hmm. the intent of completing the same, so. So after calculated separately should be your semicolon because you're making kind of a list here, yeah. And then after side elevations, the with each elevation to be calculated separately, you need a comma there. Yeah. Because that's a sub a sub clause. Okay. I don't think you need front or back, but whatever everybody thinks. Okay. What do you mean though? I, I like I like this. Um, I mean, I guess some people might say, what is front side or back? But uh, to me, it gives some clarity. Oops, that any part of the structure shouldn't be changed. Mm -hmm. OK, great. Where Okay, so um, we still need to incorporate this. Are you are you proposing just having it be this be B or something? Well, if you want to do that, or you can just you can go back and add it after the semicolon. Oh, but your semicolon is between letters. Right. Well, then take the semicolon out. Yeah, and make it a comma there. You can. Okay. Sorry. Okay. I or thought, initially it was, they were, thought it was separate. Okay. Ben, I make that. I might make that a right. And that seems what other definitions did. Like full demolition is considered is kind of like their first. And then B would be initiating the work of total destruction. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And then twenty five percent, and then it's almost like the a hierarchy of. Okay, so you're saying this should now be B. Now, I think that any act of pulling down, removing or raising, we're saying 25% or more. To me, that would be B and A would be the total destruction. You know, it's like severity of demolition. It's total destruction is 25% or more is B and then, and then just C is you're modifying. Good point. Modifying. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, here, yeah, I'm yeah. gonna... And it would be so initiating. Sort of initiating, yeah. I, uh, I turn track changes off. <laughs> I've, I'm doing it too, so I can send it to you if you get mixed up because I'm taking down what we're saying on my copy. So I think, you know, yeah, we can have, again, staff look at this, but I think the way we just worked on um, the 25% or more is really clear for staff to you know, in the future for someone to say, okay, what, how do we calculate the 25% and, you know, it can be, um, to me, that's clear. Mm -hmm. So right. where does initiating the work of total destruction go? That's A. Right. That's what I thought. Yeah. I, you, you're, you're getting it kind of cut up here, Ben. So initiating is A. Which could be colon, oh, any oh. act of pulling down, destroying, recovering, or raising. Okay, no, that's same. Same. Yeah, and then B is any act of pulling down the 25% with each elevation calculated separate, and C is the act of changing or modifying. Um. Okay, I, yeah, I am getting confused. So any yeah, act of pulling down. Let me paste this in an email to you. Okay. And then you can just. So the any act of pulling down, destroying, raising 25% um, or more. This is, that first sentence is part of B. And then yes. A begins with initiating the work of total destruction. Uh, okay. I just sent it to you. There we go. It's always easy for to edit than to be the one making all the <laughs> yeah. real time, Ben. All right, so that can maybe be lower. And then case. after calculated separately, comma, or semicolon. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And I guess, okay. you know, 
if we're moving on to C, you know, staff has some questions about, again, how, you know, how, how would staff interpret important architectural elements? And then, you know, I think there's a question here, who decides, you know, this historic integrity of the design? So I think, you know, just, it becomes something that, you know, if we were trying to make it clearer to an applicant, I think the first two right now are pretty good. This one becomes, you know, you're taking off the shutters of a building or you're taking off some, you know, some fascia detail. Is that subject to a demolition application? If it's, if it's architectural elements that are historic, I would say so. If it comes under less than 25%, though? If it's less than what if there's two chimneys and they're super historic in style and they take those two chimneys down, but that's not 25% of any side? Right, they take all the casings off the windows. Right, yeah. that's, that's why we need to see, and maybe it needs to be clearer. Well, I but think, it's why know, we need to see, because the subgroup. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think Chris Skelly had said that Mass Historic wouldn't even consider, like, do, what Jan, you just mentioned, or I mentioned, would not be considered, would not be, would not be applicable to the demolition review bylaw. What so do they, they know? Just, they'll, they'll let it go. Mm -hmm. um, well, we're tougher. <laughs> I would add chimneys as our, in our examples, if we're just going to list examples to make it clear. But those are exemptions, right? Uh, oh, except for exemptions. That's but not limp. Wait. Oh, they are. Exempt. I think this is awkward. I don't think that's what we meant. No, I don't think so either. No. So this is what I. This is a. I found a bylaw draft from who knows when, twenty nineteen or something. Uh, that in which the commission developed just this short list of historic or architectural features. And I, I added this in like last week. Um, yeah, but so. you're, you're adding it to the, the list of exemptions. It's the opposite. Well, it says except for exemptions is found within okay, the Okay, so I just need to I, switch yeah. the order here. Switch the order, yeah. And, and let's add chimneys. Okay. <laughs> so X, Y, Z, that was just, you were just, Thing if there's anything else, right? Yeah. Okay. And then I, I guess we have to see what the exemptions are. We'll get there. So I guess that's interesting. So I guess one question is right. So if they're removing um, these elements, but it's not 25% or more, they would still need to submit an application. Correct. Yes. Yeah. That's how we can maintain a little control over specific things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If they're important architectural or key architectural elements, I, I agree. I think they should be. But is that yeah. something that the building commissioner, town staff, how do we decide what gets submitted to review? Is that part of what the designee? Yeah, I mean, it's no longer does. necessarily the building commissioner. And I think Rob was saying that if this becomes kind of a commission process that, you know, it would be the staff to the commission and maybe the historical commission designee. But you know, it, we, it would be, I think it'd be really on staff. So Ben, it would be you, for instance, in your position, or if, you know, if it was with me, with me, it wouldn't be, we can ask Rob for his interpretation, but it wouldn't be, we wouldn't be relying on the building commissioner as the mm -hmm. one making that decision. Should if, if there was a house that had all the accoutrements of gingerbread, et cetera, et cetera, Victorian, and they decided to make it look modern, that would be destroying historical aspect of architecture. Mm -hmm. Kind of a simplistic example, but. So can we, can we move to the next yeah. item and then we can yeah. get, get to exemptions later, but okay, so yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Then you sent us a chart showing the percentages of communities that had oh, yeah. various length of bylaws and about 37, 39% had 12 months. Um, 
there were the same, yeah, and the same percent the, the same percentage had six months so majority had either six months or 12 months yeah 12 there, months. it was uh so and yeah i think 154 communities have demolition delay bylaws and of those communities only i think eight percent had more than 18 months so but but 30 Seven thirty nine percent. I I don't have it in front of me anymore. But but had um, at least a twelve month delay. And um, there's an advantage right. to an eighteen month in that maybe some some restoration or some some repurposing could take place because there'd be enough time to have that happen. But I I don't have an opinion on whether it should be 18 months or 12 months. I don't think it should be less than 12 months. Mm -hmm. Nate, we had thought that there would be um, points that the council would argue on this. And we wanted to have some things that we were putting in that we'd be willing to be flexible <laughs> on in order to give them a sense of power. And this was one of the things we thought we'd start with 18. If they really were upset and wanted to go to 12, we'd say, okay, we gave you that, but then you can't have this. Yeah, you know I think yeah, I think, you know, I think the council and CRC would say 18 months is too long and staff even felt like it was too long. Um, you know, it's hard to say that there's, you know, if there were, you know, perhaps maybe if the town had a revolving fund that was successful in helping um, property mm -hmm. owners or we had some other programs that are already in place, then maybe 18 months, but with, with the, you know, the absence of those, I think 18 months just seems really long. And I, it, you know, I, I, I know what you're saying, you know, the commission is putting forward its best, it's, you know, what, what it would want to be as an ideal bylaw. Um, but I, I think that that this 18 months is definitely going to be one point that is going to be contentious. And so. But it's yeah. a bargaining chip. As and Kelly did tell us that Mass Historical is recommending 18 months to everybody now. So we're on the cutting edge here. Yeah, I, but I we mean, could back out of that if if it was contentious. I I think Jan Jan is right, and we were thinking to put it out there because it's being recommended, but it's nothing that we're wedded to. Right. I just yeah. I think the if the for instance if the CRC or town council asked some staff what they think, they would say eighteen months is too long. So mm -hmm. you know it would just be you know, I think staff would say 12 months is fine. That's what we have. I just think the 18 months becomes a, a lightning rod for, mm. for opposition. Um, so it's not yeah. a bargaining chip in your opinion. It just sets us up negatively to begin with, you think? Yeah, and also I, maybe Nate, you know better than I, but my sense is, I don't actually know how much like, you know, bargaining there is once we get to town council i know it goes through crc review but my sense is you know we have to we present the bylaw as in its finished state essentially mm -hmm. and i don't know do we work with crc to like edit it or is it more just like they review it and then recommend or don't recommend to town council yeah i think actually I, think oh, I don't yeah i, 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 I just i just don't know well, if that's the case, then we don't want to put anything radical out. Yeah. No, yeah, so I'm not sure. Yeah, I think the CRC on. might spend a meeting or two looking at this, but I don't know right if there's going to be like, oh, let's invite the commission to a working meeting where we yeah. discuss points. They might just say, well, we don't like this. Let's strike it. <laughs> yeah. And then, and you know, I'm assuming the commission would respond, but yeah, I don't know. You know, I feel like it hasn't really been done, actually. This is, you know, the, um, it's this is kind of a new ground for the CRC and, you know, <clears throat> Uh, even the planning board and town councils, you know, they just met the other week to discuss how do zoning amendments go through. You know, I think the whole process is kind of in question, but um, yeah. So I, why know, don't we I, turn it around and say, make it a, a 12 month delay, but in the presentation, make uh, a big point of saying that Mass Historical is recommending 18 months, but because we're so reasonable, we're. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, mean, I think Ben, your chart is interesting too to have just to say that 18 months and even 24 months, I mean, you know, communities are doing that just. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it is interesting, you know, the, um, you know, the housing trust often with CPA funds often ask for half a million dollars. And I'm always like, that's just, you know, there's no way we're going to half the CPA money. And 
the chair is like, well, why don't we ask for it? Then every year the CPA committee says, oh, we'll give you 200. <laughs> and so I'm like, I don't, you know, it's like asking for 200 to me. I don't think they say, well, we're just going to give you 100. I think we could really make the case that a year, like we, we're, we're, the commission in the town would really go no shorter than 12 months. And if they want to consider more, we could, we could put that in a, in a, in a letter as part of the presentation, you know, we're, we think 12 months is the minimum we would recommend or we, you know, longer, but, or something, but 12 months is the minimum we'd, we'd stay, you know, we'd, yeah, we may come back later and ask for more or something. But mm -hmm. maybe a comment about how long this has been the standard in Amherst. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're keeping, we're keeping consistent with that. Right. Yeah, I just read an article about like, you know, if you don't answer spam phone calls, do you get less? And it was actually a really big survey and they found that it doesn't matter. I used to think that, yeah, maybe if you just don't answer or hang up <laughs> and don't talk, you get less, but. I get the same spam phone calls at the same time every day on my landline. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it drives me crazy. I don't, I look and I don't answer. So you're right, Nate, it doesn't change. You answer, you don't answer. They just keep on coming. Yeah. On the other hand, sometimes if you answer, you can push a button to never be contacted again. So maybe here the thing is we talk right to the point instead of hoping they just skip past it. Right. We talk well, by the I, 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 I would prefer not to have red flags. If it's not a bargaining yeah. chip, let's not have a red flag. But we can address it in the cover letter as it makes sense. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I, yeah. And I'm serious about saying to them, you know, I think it's a, an educational moment that, um, you know, that this is what the trend is in our state. Mm -hmm. But we understand that um, that our 12 month delay has been effective so far. Uh, nah. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> or we could say, we know you're hand in hand with the contractors who won't let you make this kind of decision, so. <laughs> it could be really awful. Okay, so, so, so 12 it will be. Needs to, um, the rest of this needs to be altered because of our, our new procedure. And, uh, yeah, I mean, does the commission like the idea of this being, you know, a commission, a commission's, you know, um, you know, it's staff in the commission reviewing it. We can always ask the building commissioner, but you know, we're no longer relying on the building commissioner as say like the interpreter of the bylaw, it becomes staff in the commission. And then it's the commission issuing a, a, a permit at the end or something, not guidance to the building commissioner. I mean, it is, it is a bit, it is a bit, it's state a- Building code, would it still state that it was under the state building code? No, it would be relevant, to. would it? Okay, so it'd be a building permit issued no, it wouldn't be a building permit. It'd be a demolition permit, permit issued by the historical commission. It'd be yep. a permit issued for demolition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But so it isn't that, that needs to be changed in your demolition permit to take out a building. It would. But by I mean the historical the, um, commission. The uh the building commissioner Rob still needs to issue a demolition permit eventually, right? That that's still Yeah, a, so essentially if the commission, you know, if this, if we kind of change the process and the commission issued a delay on a building, the commission issues a demolition, um, um, a delays, I don't know, whatever we say, the building, you know, Rob would, could not issue a building permit to demolish until after that delays expired. And so essentially the applicant can't even, you know, they, they can't even apply for a, dem, a building permit to demolish. Whereas so that now, definition stands then? Um, we, I mean, I, I just, you know, I, to me, that I, I guess when I, when we were, when I was thinking about this moving to the general bylaw, it was setting up a process for the commission without having to have a building permit issued in some respect. So that way, to me, it just, it, it reduces confusion. But and, so you're saying if we, if we don't do a delay and we issue a permit, there yeah. still has to then be a building permit for demolition? Yes. Well, yeah. I think we, we would be issued, we wouldn't be issuing a permit per se we'd be issuing a certificate and then rob yeah. rob can't oh, rob right. can't rob will then need that certificate to issue the demolition permit right it'd be a prerequisite in either right. way either one 
So we'd have two things. We'd have demolition permit, which is the building commissioner. And then we'd have a certificate or authorization to demolish, which comes from us. So yeah, but, another yeah. definition. And so that, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and somehow that that's out of, out of order um, alphabetically, but it's somehow connected to the demolition delay. And so maybe in that, it needs to say if, if a demolition delay is not imposed, a certificate to demolish will be issued. And are we delaying mm -hmm. a demolition permit? Or are we delaying right. the authorization to demolish? We're delaying the authorization to demolish. But right. if we don't delay the, the, the demolition, then we, we um, have a certificate of authorization to demolish. Right. The commission would, right, would actually be issuing something in the affirmative. Right, so that somehow isn't alphabetically here, but it should be part of dem maybe demolition um, certificate or demolition delay demolition certificate. I really hate the word certificate. I think authorization <laughs> is better. Yeah, it's, it's a little confusing with local historic district, but I do think. Yeah. I mean, what we're, what are we doing? We're authorizing demolition. Right. Right. So demolition authorization. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then we can. Whoops. What am I doing? Insert. Cells below. Rows below. Demolition authorization. But that should go probably go before demolition. Oh no! Uh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Well, demolition delay. They're they're all connected. But demolition delay and demolition authorization. So demolition demolition authorization should probably come after demolition. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, for instance, right now, if someone comes to the commission, like uh, just this evening, and the commission voted to allow the demolition, we just transmit that Oops. to staff. But there's nothing ever recorded. You know, it's just like, okay, uh, the demolition can proceed, but now the commission would actually be issuing, you know, a form or something that would be given to the applicant that they would use then to apply for a building permit to demolish. So, right. And so this would be if, if, if a demolition is deemed not necessary to be delayed or something to that effect, right. then uh, authorization is, is issued. And then if the delay, if, if, it's, if it's delayed and then eventually a demolition permit, is that the right order? Mm -hmm. Well, you guys can go in and kind of straighten up. Yeah, yeah. That part of it. Because it's gonna be woven into almost everything in here. Exactly. All right. Um, so yeah, I do think Nate and I can, and with Rob's help, uh, do these definitions. Then yeah, like Jan said, weave it into the rest of the bylaw. I really like the idea, though, Nate. Well, quickly, well, uh, what about the um, appeals process? Can you, Nate? I, I haven't been through it, but how does it work in local historic district? And would we want to do something similar here? Yeah, I think if we went, yeah, I think. You know, one, uh, if we're looking at the owner, you know, Rob thought that nowhere else in the in any bylaws, we really concern ourselves, the town with oh, the right. change of ownership, you know, because it, um, you know, it, it gets into some some legal complexity, you know, who, who exactly is an owner, if it's an LLC, if there's partners, and it just, it can get really complicated. And so, you know, we ask that an owner uh, if they're not the applicant, sign an application. So we actually, we, you know, that's required by state law that there be an, an owner signature, but to define an owner then to use it to say that a permit is no longer valid after a change of ownership, that's really not done. It just gets really complicated. Can and we so, just take know, owner out of there since we have applicant? But, really but the, like, owner is, the owner is the, the um, legal entity on record as owner. Right. And it can I be think, an LLC, it can be uh, an individual, it can be 
But I think, uh, an I think the reason why this was a, a, a defined term was because later in the bylaw, it said that on, upon change of ownership, the permit would expire. And so staff's recommendation is to take out that clause that it would expire upon change of ownership. And then you could delete the definition here because. Sounds good. So I'd like to do a time check. It's, it's about 10, 12 minutes to nine. Oh. And, um, do you think, uh, do you all want to stay around till nine or, or later? Or shall we try to address uh, any other definition questions in the next 10, 12 minutes and then, uh, and then conclude for tonight? Staff didn't really have any other questions really about the definitions. No. So what if, what if we can work on whatever the next thing is, but, and, and the rest of the agenda, which seems to have taken care of itself and, 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 um, adjourn at nine and leave Nate and Ben to clean up some of this stuff that we, we seem to be right on the verge of getting right. Yeah. And come we back. I wanted at, to talk about the making a distinction between preferably preserved and significant, didn't you? Exactly. Yeah. Well, I think, yes. yeah, I think the, um, you know, what staff felt was that there was really good criteria about how to determine something to be significant, but it was almost as if that criteria could or, or should be used to determine if it's preferably preserved. And maybe to determine if it's significant, you just have like some really simple ones. You know, it's 50 years or older, it's- um, Listed. Yeah, you know, cause I think, um, you know, for instance, like the two, three and four, I mean, those, those pieces. They fit within the statement of the designation of preferably preserved, you're right. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, to me, it was almost like take two, three, and four and make it as part of the review of it being preferably preserved and just come up with one or two simple uh, parameters for be being significant. I think some of it was too staff felt that the way it's written now under preferably preserved, it, it gave a lot of deference to the what's um, what's happening on the property, what's the future plans. And the question is, well, what if an applicant doesn't have any future plans? And they might not. And so there has to be some pretty clear criteria for the commission to determine preferably preserved because, you know, an applicant after the first, if this was passed and, you know, people are paying attention, they might not, they might come to the commission without any plans. Mm -hmm. because they might think that that would jeopardize their review and so they're just going to play dumb right um but if there's some pretty good criteria here uh, but isn't it okay to i mean isn't a isn't a future plan isn't to have no plan isn't that a kind of future plan in itself <laughs> Well, it's a concern, and I think we should know that and weigh that because if somebody's just demolishing it and leaving an empty lot, that's a problem. Yeah, I think that can be one of the review pieces for properly preserved, but it shouldn't be like the major one because, you know, for instance, someone someone may think, well, the commission isn't going to like what I'm presenting, and they just don't present it, but they may in their back pocket have their plans. Okay, well, that could maybe be number five. It would be two, yeah. three, four, five. Right. right. I, no, I, I agree. I think the future plans of a property can be part of the review for a building being properly preserved. And that's actually one of the reasons why we're doing this two-step process to begin with. Right. But I I'd think, like to, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to go back to the criteria for significance for a moment. If if the only ones we're going to use are the age of the, of the building and what, or whether or not it's a contributing structure or listed, that's going to give us everything back. Thousands of significant structures, and that's we don't want that. No, yeah. what the whole points was that it would all be done by staff and the building commissioner, and not come to us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now it's all going to come again. Date, you I mean, were think... that, weren't you? No, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't actually. But it, I think. When we were meeting with staff, they it, it seemed to make sense because I, I think you know the idea was if we determine something significant, 
and we have these clearly laid out criteria when you get to how to determine to designate preferably preserved, there just isn't a lot there. And so staff was saying, isn't, even if it's just repeated, because aren't you, you might even look at what's been the research that's already been done to determine if it's preferably preserved. You might yeah. want to know, is it the we work have of that. the architecture builder? Yeah. Well, we it, say that. We say including criteria in section E1 to 4. Yeah, I think staff just felt it was more, I mean, maybe, maybe it's already said, and then we just have to point that out again. Um, yeah. Uh, well, uh, Nate, we uh, we just added this last meeting. So, like Rob and Chris. Didn't oh yeah, see, you all didn't, didn't see, see that. Didn't yeah. see that. Okay. Um, so yeah. So maybe that maybe that covers it then. Um, yeah, because I looking at other bylaws. I mean, it's pretty interesting, and also it's what Chris Skelly. Uh, there's really no criteria for preferably preserved, except that it's in the public interest to preserve or rehabilitate the structure. That's that's like the standard language. Right. Um, yeah, everything you're seeing there, I made up. Just working. Right. Up yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So <laughs> not taken from anybody else's <laughs> um, document. It was just talking to Chris Skelly and then just kind of, I don't know, weaving words together. Yeah, and I mean, you don't directly say public interest, but you talk about en environmental, economic, educational, social advantages. Um, Historic identities and possible. I do say public interest. I say the historical commission in the public oh, interest. The there you go. Perfect. Historic. And I think if anything, you're just expanding on what it, what the what that public interest is with right. all these things. So I think you're, we're consistent with what other towns are doing, and then we clarify that it's you know we consider all of these things above here plus the. Uh, um, future plans for reu reuse, reconstruction, or restoration. All right, so I think- Can I if, make a suggestion about just a, to, just to strengthen the- Yeah. Um, uh, including criteria uh, above. Um, could we say including additional review of criteria? In That's section a good one? idea. Yeah. 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 So I think if, if, if the criteria above for significance remains, you know, there was a concern that it could take some time with staff, right? Staff would have to dedicate a little bit of time. And so the thought was to increase the review time when an application is received, right? I think Ben, there wasn't there the idea that maybe add, a, add like a week, but just, you know, because staff may have to work with special collections or just do a little more research to determine some of these, to really review some of these criteria. To determine yeah. significant, you mean for designation as significant? Right, for significance, uh -huh. right, right. My, my thought here is that um, if we say uh, additional review or more intensive review or something like that, that mm -hmm. means that up in E, that can be based on somewhat less research. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that it's just a matter of proportion in a sense, so that it, mm -hmm. it but it depends on whether we're, um, you know, we have to balance the speed of the review and responsiveness right. to the owner with right. the amount of work that needs also, to be done. Also, remember, we're saying if it meets one or more, so it could only have to meet one for significance, right? Yeah. So that doesn't mean quite as much research. Does it say one or more? Um, yep, it does. It says if it's 50 years old, it meets okay. one or more of the following. Yep. Oh yeah, and I like the uh, insertion, Jane, of additional review or something down below that really kind of reinforces that you know that, yeah. that information can be brought and it will be brought into the public hearing. So it's not as mm -hmm. if it's you know left with staff. Yeah. I do mm -hmm. think uh, I'm just speaking for me as the staff person who might be looking at this later on. Is the the number four would give me trouble. I mean, I, I think I know the intent, but it's still a little vague in my mind. Like these three are all very clear. It's listed, it's associated with a historic person or event. That's stuff you can look up. You know, it has high craftsmanship or style. Architecturally, that's, you know, something that can be determined. But then this one, I guess I'm still a little bit confused about, like obviously the single car garage we looked at is set back from the street. It's not really part of the view shed, but like 
Well, maybe once we write the definition, that'll be easier. It's, it's, I don't think it's any less subjective than three. But I guess what is it? What's the intent? Is that you know, if 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 a house has been on a street for fifty years, um, does that automatically make it significant? Like what? I just I guess. Well, it would have to be. Well, it's one or more. So you're you're right, Ben. It's confusing. It could but be think, making you know, it significant, but it doesn't mean we won't but agree. This could be the one demolition. Right, but this could be the one thing where I don't, I can't, I'm not coming up with a good example, but- um, Well, the, the house on Pleasant Street that's being moved, we right. determined that it was a familiar landscape feature, a street, you know, streetscapes feature, but then we said it could still be moved, it could still be demolished. So right. that's the moment that Jane was talking about where you say, yes, it is, but then you have additional review of that criteria under preferably preserved and you determine it's significant, but it does not preferably preserve. I do think that this, but to Ben's point, this number four, I think if you read this as it's written, a visual, uh, you know, it's some, taken from the current bylaw. To me, it's really vague and anything then would be, cap, could be, could be, um, could be captured by this. So, yeah, you know, but, so that, that, to me, that, takes a, but that, that makes it really difficult. I think, than anything anything that's been there for 50 years is now a familiar part of the view shed and so what is the to me i would have i would like to i think a little bit more um, maybe we should add something like there. the word historic in there <laughs> classy <laughs> what well, i mean i think Facebook? the the well, we say you, unique yeah. location or appearance you know, how many times do we drive down the street and we don't pay, take note of many of the buildings on the street? Hey, you know, but this we, could fit the Bank of America building. Right. <laughs> we all notice that. We all notice that. So do we want That's, to preserve it, Chan? <laughs> well, that, well, I would not vote for it being preferably preserved, but it definitely <laughs> is significant. But is this, is this really about I, its, its relationship to the streetscape? And buildings, and it, you know, not. I mean, I, is there a way to to write to me, this so that it's, it's a little? It's what Jan just said. It's like something that every. I mean, I always think of this this one as as it's tough, but I think of it as like something that everybody knows. You know that it's it's so unique. It's not just that it's been on you know Dana Street for fifty years. I mean, I think the Bank of America building is a really great example. The, the building across the street, everybody knows it because it's such an obvious part of town. Or I also think of it as like, you know, the, I always think for some reason, I always think of the Bob's Big Boy statue. Like it's so unique. Everyone, mm -hmm. everyone would know what it is. Um, but it is, I mean, you know, how you, how you define that in clear terms is-, is an And question. you laugh, but people who grow up in this town in 30 years, they're gonna be horrified if you talk about taking down that Bank of America building. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so I guess, so, but for, so how would, you know, so if I was staff reading number four and someone came in, they said, oh, I'm, I'm tearing down 79 Logtown Road and it's over 50 years, I think staff would say, oh, well, it's a, uh, it's it's familiar. It meets this criteria, so I, I feel like it's just not. So not it's not a commission. But it, but it says it says unique location or presumably unique appearance. I mean, Logtown Road is an elite unique location. I can't imagine that the houses. I mean, I know the houses there. They don't have a unique appearance. That's what I think of is that that it's either stands out so much because of where it's located, or stands out so much because of what it looks like. You want to say yeah, unique I, or yeah. historic? I don't. I, no. I mean, but when I look at number two and three, the way it's written, you can really understand what how you would do some research and apply it to the application. Oh, I agree. Here, I, I feel like it's pretty. Four is pretty vague to me. I well, just maybe think that four, but, maybe four fits into two. You know, it has value in association with a specific location. Maybe that's good enough. And I, I, but I see, I mean, I guess I was thinking about this, like, is it, um, you know, is it, if I, if I was thinking about this, like, you know, I'd say, is it a, is it, does it contribute to or enhance the streetscape or, you know, are there other ways to say 
what we what you know what number oh, rather than just saying it's familiar right going beyond that yeah we could say familiar uh and and valued view shed but to tell the truth i i jan i kind of agree with you that the first clause in number two covers it maybe we can buff up number two a little bit and get rid of four I mean, the way this is written, it, 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 it will always be vague and subjective. But mm -hmm. if we throw in some more words that we've used elsewhere, like valued, uh, right. that, might, that might help. But I think the real question is, do we, do we need this? Um, does it say something that is not said up in number two? Maybe something like in number two, where we say the broad architectural, social, political, economic, or cultural heritage, we say very visual heritage, visual appearance of the town of Amherst, and then drop four. But there could be there could be a building that doesn't satisfy any of those things, Maybe but every time you pass it, you notice it. Like the Bank of America. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Well, you know, I what about what about the more you know and I, I don't know if they're 1960s or 1970s modern houses that are up on Redgate Road I mean that's something that I think of has a unique appearance like if one of those came up for demolition that would be I think it would come under too the broad architectural economic heritage I mean that period that, that was a big expansive time and that's an architectural style that's very important in the town. Yeah, or number three, right, number three, right? Yeah. Yeah, or three, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, I always argue this on those two and then we get to four. I mean, we have this similar list and it's almost redundant. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, think that, okay. I know that some of the counselors have, you know, with the current bylaw, you know, as, as it relate, relates to number four, they're going to have a lot of questions about how that is interpreted and applied to an application. So I know they've already said like, what, something that's familiar, does that mean everything? So they have the same kind of right. questions about, you know, how I've, do you- I've heard that too. Uh, I so, don't get rid of so it. So what if in number three, we were to talk about the view shed? But to me, I'm a not sure- in the context of a group of buildings has historical or arch architectural value significance to the view shed as a period stock but a, but a we're talking about significance here right so i would see it more incorporating it in three than in two because we talk about alone or in the context as historical or architecture value um as to period style craftsmanship method of or or, or uh, significance in enhancing the uh, establishing and enhancing the familiar view shape. It doesn't clarify it that much more, but it but it um, mm -hmm. it it puts it in with the fact that it's a building you notice. You know, we could just slip view shed in after a group of buildings alone or in the context of a group of buildings or view shed. That's a good idea. Well, yeah, that would work, Jane. Yeah. We would then have to well, we notice. Nate, does that clarify it for you? Yeah, I, mean, I was just, I just wrote a note, you know, to kind of think about how does a building, how is a building significant to a view shed? Um, but I think putting it in here, I mean, it kind of describes what you're looking for then. Right. Um, Right, and, and you know, more so than, than the one and two. Right, and then how does its location have public value? So, you know, when we, we apply for CPA funds to um, restore the barn down on West Street, which it didn't work out, but one of the arguments was that it became, you know, it, because it was so, um, it became a visual feature of the landscape, of the historic landscape. And so I think it would, it would meet some of these other criteria, but, you know, I was just trying to think of how do we, how do we write that um, 
but maybe inserting it the so, way you did, it just- it Ben, I think you just did that wrong. I excuse the wrong part. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the building alone or in context of a group of, of, buildings, a group of buildings. Okay, I just didn't want it to be like a group of view sheds or something, but- Yeah, the view shed it, 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 or a group of buildings or, or, or a view shed. Okay. Yeah, I think that, I think staff would be able to, I think that makes it a lot easier to say, okay, well, how, right, what's the value in relationship to the view shed or buildings? And so you're applying the rest of that. Right. Yeah. There's something about that building mm -hmm. in the view shed. Um, and, and this is the criteria for it. Right. Mm -hmm. Well. I still think it's awkward. Alone or in the context of a group of buildings or as part of a view shed. Right. Right. I mean, yeah, yeah. precisely. There, okay. Yeah. So I think we've solved, it sounds to me like we've done a lot of uh, problem solving with the, uh, with the criteria and it is yeah. all 909. Oh my God, this is like my one night out a week here. I'm I'm ready to stay out. <laughs> you and I can stay on. I don't on, have the line in the back room here. <laughs> if the kids are being taken care of, let's open a bottle and keep going. <laughs> so uh, let's go back to. Um, is there any member of the public who wishes to make a comment? It hasn't fallen asleep yet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I take that as an as oh, unless you we'll, we'll allow Hilda to talk. Oh, yeah. is Hilda still there? Is she, she is, is yeah. Time? Yeah, I just want to make Hilda. sure one thing. Hilda, you're that amazing. line about visible from the street is deleted forever. It is. Yes. Okay. Because I was going to say that I got four bonds here, and I don't think you can see any of them from the street unless more trees come down. And one of them, Mrs. Okay. Rand said, was Robert Frost's favorite bond, and she's no longer around to document that. But but you can't see them, can't see them from the street. So I just want to make sure that that's gone. That was my only guess. Yeah, yeah, that's been yeah. taken out. They might be significant now, even if we can't see them. But I want to come see them now that you they sound interesting. Anytime you've got pictures of them. Do we? They actually, they look better when they apple, bla apple blossoms or crab apples around. But nice. It's nice in the snow too, Jen. Great. I'm ready for a field trip. Thank you, Hilda. <laughs> so have you got this thing almost done already? Almost. It's pretty Almost. boring. Hey, <laughs> you think it's boring from your point of view? We've been working on this thing for four years. I, I've been listening to one for four years. I think that probably Louis worked on it too. How many years ago was that? That was when when Jim was chair. Well, that would have been the version that we're revising. I think that was the poet's walk too. Yeah. It definitely was the writer's walk was underway then. Writer's walk well, that's been around for so long. I can't yeah. wait to see it's it. It's going to be finished this year. <laughs> right, Nate? It is. I promise. All right. I can I say goodbye now. I just want to make sure because there are a lot of historical things that you can't see. Mm -hmm. And that whole thing about Robert Frost and, and Warren Brown was a true story. My husband knew that and he would tell them that and nobody would listen. And then it was documented somewhere because Louie used to see them walking around town all the time, back in the fifties. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Hilda. Um, yeah, all right. Well, I'm trying to find something here that would be of interest to put in the indie. I'll show a picture of the garage with the murals. <laughs> Because that looks like everything people want to put on their walls now. I call it, you know, pot art. <laughs> well, next to last is unanticipated items. Are there any? 
Nope. Then no. let's set our next meeting date. Yeah. So I know we we had talked about possibly doing March twenty second. Um, I I have a conflict um, that night, unfortunately. Um, so I was gonna. See I'm us. leaving. Goodbye. Okay. Thanks, Hilda. Bye, Hilda. Hilda. Bye, Hilda. Good night. Um, I was just gonna see if folks could meet uh, March twenty fourth, possibly. Sometimes we do Wednesday meetings. The twenty fourth works for me. Works for me. Me too. Okay. I awesome. hope Nate can get the night out. <laughs> I think it'll, I'm I'm always around. Maybe. Great, and I'll um so March twenty fourth, and then I'll transmit that to um who did we lose Jane. Jane Scheffler. And Hetty, right? Hetty, Hetty. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, okay. Do, do, do we want to so set in April? Okay. 6.30, Ben, is the time? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Did we want to set like a tentative April date? Um, I have a feeling yeah. I might I might get uh, applications maybe from the Conkey House in March, so it'd be nice to kind of set have a date for them in mind. We could do an April date where we launch the Riders Walk signs. <laughs> Hopefully, that'd be great. <laughs> so I actually have on my calendar the twenty first. Yeah, I for our too. meeting in April. Did we set that already? Oh, maybe, yeah, maybe we I did. Oh, I do have that written down. Nice. Okay. But I, but I had the 17th of March, so that is that is off the record. Yeah. So 24th. Yeah, March 24th. Okay. And then April is the 21st? Yeah, we did have the 17th of March. We weren't on the 22nd. Oh. No. Yeah. We were on the 17th. We had already we made this adjustment because it's the third Wednesday. Can we keep the 17th? Is that, will that work for you, Ben? Um, it might, I might be in actually in California that day. I'm actually traveling. Um, but I was thinking about actually working the 16th and 17th. So it'd be at, what would that be at 3.30? Um, I mean, I, I guess I, I would rather do the 24th. Okay, well that's, um, that's fine. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. It's fine with me. But then the then the twenty first of April. Yeah. Which is the third Wednesday. Right. And then I mark the nineteenth of May, which is the third Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Can we try to stick to the third Wednesday? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, that sounds okay. good. And actually I've I've been meaning to uh, update our website and I was thinking of having like a like a future meetings date. On, on there as well. So it'd be nice to start kind of thinking about setting those dates like a few months in advance. So yeah, because we never show on the town calendar if somebody wanted to know when we were meeting. I mean, yeah, I don't exactly. know if I want them to, but <laughs> they would not see it by looking at the but, but right. you have to post the meetings, Ben, right? 48 hours in advance. Um, yep. Well, yeah. 48. Yeah. For public hearings. hearings. Yeah. For public hearings. Right? Yep. Right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. okay. So shall I um, make a motion that we um, adjourn the meeting? Yes, please. I make a motion we adjourn the meeting. Thank Second. You. Second. Third. <laughs> That's unanimous. Thank you. Good night, all. all right. See Thanks, you everyone. next month. Bye. Be Bye. safe. Bye. Be well. Take ben, care. I'll um I'll go over it with the fine tooth comb after you guys adjust it for the new system. And yeah. I'll save what I've already done. Okay. okay. I've, I've done a few, like at the very beginning, there was an awkward line. I've done a few things yeah. but, and I'll just wait because it'll be like a final a kind of roofing and editing. Okay. That, that sound sounds good? good. Yeah. Oh, and as far as um, the other thing you and I need to talk about is the, um, where is it? You know, the, oh, the historical Amherst, historic Amherst uh, website before the yeah. signs go in. Um, I guess I should just go through and mark some of the stuff because you're going to get the codes and be making the changes now, right? He's going to give you the codes. I have, I have the login now. Yeah. Login. Okay. Um, so then I guess I just need to find a time to sit down and go through them because there's, you know, 
there's some tweaking definitely that needs to be done. Okay. So, uh, I guess we maybe we should do some sort of disclaimer or something because there's um, you know there's larger pockets of information for each of the buildings that was written by the students and I don't want to mm -hmm. hurt his feelings by taking a lot of that out but some of it is really um, either slightly inaccurate or biased and oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know if there's a way for us to kind of have like official town information and then this was also available through a seminar at you you know students from a seminar at umass also we could wrote. do that like label it as like additional that. additional information or something. yeah so that we don't get in trouble i could see somebody like hilda getting in there and really yeah <laughs> <laughs> telling us wait and i mean i feel uncomfortable that's why i rewrote a lot of them you know right so. right Okay, well, let's let's think about that and I'll, I'll try and find time to go through each page. Okay, I'm happy to share the login um, and kind of I, it seemed pretty straightforward how to edit text. What does he use? What's his um, his program? I, I don't really remember. It's a it's like a blogging platform. Oh. I forget the name of it. It doesn't use HTML. I, we don't have to do, I mean, I can do. No, that. no, I don't think so. No. Yeah. Okay, well, let's see how much is necessary and we can work on it together. We could even like, I could go with rough lifts and then we could open it and work on it together. Right. Yeah, that sounds good. So, okay, great. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Best Take up. care. Bye. Bye-bye.